Uh, welcome to the Police and Crime Committee. Uh, before we begin, on behalf of uh, the committee, I'd like to thank the Metropolitan Police Service for its hard work during the period of mourning for Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. So thank you very much. Um, the, we've got, at some point during the meeting, we've got uh, 13, uh, Year 13 students coming, so I'll welcome them when they do arrive. Uh, it's nice for people to watch what we're talking about, and this is a very important meeting, a very uh, serious topic. Uh, during today's meeting, we'll be holding a discussion on the subject of missing children in London. Please, all of you, make sure that your electronic devices are switched to silent mode to avoid any interruptions. And now can I ask our clerk, Lauren, if any apologies have been received. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies for absence have been received from Assemblymember Pigeon, for whom Assemblymember Bakari is attending as a substitute, and Assemblymember Prince, for whom Assemblymember Best is substituting. Um, we will also shortly be joined virtually by Assemblymember Moema. Thank you very much. Uh, can I ask the committee to note the recommendations set out at item two and ask if uh, members have any other interest to declare? I see no indications. Thank you. Can I ask the committee to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 6th of July and the 20th of July 2022 to be signed by me as correct records? Agreed. Thank you. Can we note the completed and ongoing actions arising from previous meetings and the additional correspondence received? Noted. Thank you. Can we note the response from the Mayor to the committee's report, Violence Against Women and Girls? Noted. Thank you. And so now we move on to our main item of business, the discussion on missing children in London. So I'd like to welcome our guest, Commander Kevin Southworth, Southworth who is Head of Profession Safeguarding at the Metropolitan Police. Uh, Will Balakrishnan, Krishnan, beg your pardon. I never Perfect. get that right. <laughs> Thank you. Director of Commissioning and Partnerships at MOPAC. Susanna Drury, Director of Policy and Development, Missing People. Sarah Parker, Research and Development Officer, Catch 22, and co chair of the English Coalition for Runaway Children. Mark Stevens, uh, Senior Service Manager at Catch-22, and Beverly Hendricks, Assistant Director of Safeguarding and Social Care, London Borough of Haringey. So welcome to you. And also joining us remotely is Sherry Peck, who is the Chief Executive of Safer London. And hello, welcome to you as well. So I'm going to start the uh, questions off, uh, and then I'll direct who they to go to, if I may, please. So. Um, the, the big first catch question really is how how has the number of incidents and individual children missing in London changed over the past five years? If I start with you, Commander, work my way around and then ask uh, Sherry at the end of it. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to everyone. Thank you for allowing us to be here today. Um, I should preface this initially by saying I think many of us recognise, and certainly we in the Met Police recognise, there are some challenges around the data in this space in terms of how we collect it and how we um, and how we analyse that in order to get behind the diagnostics of why young people go missing in the way that they do. But having said that, that is just a caveat. We do have data um, which has previously been shared with, with the committee and with other, with other forums. And what it roughly shows us in the last five years is that we, we, t we have tended to regress to the mean. So there's anywhere between sort of 25 and 27,000 missing person incidents um, on average in any one year. That did drop during the pandemic year by about two to 3,000 missing young people. But then it has regressed to that statistical mean again this year. I have two different figures in many ways, one which comes from our internal Merlin system, which is one of our main NPS data sets, which other colleagues, forgive me, won't necessarily always have access to, which tells us that roughly 26, well, not roughly, 26,031 young people went missing during the, the calendar year of uh, 21 to 22. Um, but then we also have some data from June which shows a figure just slightly lower than that, which comes to about 25,000. So there's a difference there of about four to 500 young people, depending on when the data is counted from and exactly which database you use. Um, I should say within that chair, and, and go ahead early with this, um, just this week, myself and my colleagues within the Met, we had a really productive workshop with MOPAC's Evidence and Insight Unit, um, who obviously have access to a wider range of data sets than we will in the Met. And that really productive workshop, amongst other things, has talked about a, an upcoming problem profile for missing children, uh, which we'll be able to look at all the data in the round and get a really, really accurate analysis, not just of the numbers, but of things like the diagnostics, everything from return home interviews, outcomes, 
where intervention has made a difference where it hasn't. So there should be quite an exciting and productive piece of work underway jointly between ourselves and MOPAC in, in the not too distant future to look at these figures in greater detail. Um, I don't know if you want a more granular breakdown of each year from year, which I can do if you like over those five years, Chair, or whether that headline is sufficient, what would the panel prefer? Uh, I think it's sufficient because we've got quite a few details Certainly. as you can, uh, can imagine anyway. I mean, that's a, a comprehensive answer on that. Um, is there anything sp more specifically that any of you want to add to that? Because we've got lots of questions. So um, that, that was a good a comprehensive answer. Are you all happy with that answer? And I'll go into to the next one. Sherry, did, are you? I'd like yep. to simply add, at Safe for London, I can speak primarily about those who have multiple missing episodes and those that are missing for longer. They're the children and young people that we work with. Um, and I think if our colleagues from Missing People were to, to speak on this, they'd also say that I think the figures are somewhere between um, out of every 10 children that go missing, about seven won't be reported to the police. Yeah, um, we're coming on to that. We'll, okay, we'll come and on I would that. just like to add that in, in our experience, children are going missing more frequently and we're seeing that more often. Okay, let, let's let's expand on that. If, 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 I, if I come to you, but if I ask you the next one that you can incorporate in your answer. I mean, the Children's Society has reported that two in three children that go missing are not reported to the police, um, as was just mentioned there. Do you think that's an accurate assessment? And, and what impact does that have? So if I go then on to Will and move around. Oh, thank, thanks, Chair. I was just going to I was just going to clarify slightly the the, the numbers actually. Because what Kevin was referring to missing instances, and what we know is that the children who go missing go missing more than once normally. Yeah. So uh, you know it's around about eight thousand four hundred children individuals went missing last year to then make up that twenty five thousand plus instances. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of the trend, whilst the number of instances are remaining relatively static or going slightly down over the last five years, in fact, um, the number of children going missing is going down as well. So less children are going missing more often, if that makes sense. Yes, and actually that, that, that makes a, a, when you look at the two figures, it makes a, a yeah. bigger a, a difference. I just thought, sorry, I hope, I hope that's helpful. No, that, that is helpful, um, especially for people watching who haven't got the benefit of a good briefing as well. Um, uh, Susanna, if I move to you. Thank you. Um, yes, I think those figures are accurate from the Children's Society. We certainly see that on our helpline. Lots of the young people that we speak to haven't been reported to the police. Um, and one of the main reasons for that is the most common reason for children to go missing is problems in home, whether that's a family home or care. So that might be conflict, abuse, neglect. So there might be good reasons why someone isn't reporting them missing. Um, also, we know one in five children is actually kicked out of home when they find themselves to be missing. So that's another good reason why they're, they're not going to be reported by whoever did that. Um, also, we know that some parents and carers won't report a child missing if they haven't had a good response when they previously did. So if a child is going repeatedly missing, as Will says, um, if they feel the police response wasn't helpful, for example, um, then if that happens again, they may just decide not to. Um, and also we know that there's some under-reporting as well as over-reporting mm -hmm. from care home settings. So sometimes a child might be reported late for missing curfew, for example, um, when there aren't any particular concerns. But also if a child is, has a regular pattern of behavior and seems to be coming home safe, um, then they may not be reported, even though, as, as we're all aware, that can be a big warning sign for exploitation. Okay. Sarah, have you got anything? I mean, just to say a little about the, uh, the individuals, the kind of individuals. So um, the information here is both from Catch-22, from our services that we deliver in London, but also I have spoken to the members of the ECRC, the English Coalition for Runaway Children, uh, co-chaired actually with Missing People, um, who deliver missing services in London and there's some interesting kind of um, information behind I suppose those those missing incidents and missing young people there is um, a clear increase in children missing from home as opposed to missing from care as a proportion um, compared with what has been the case in the past um, 
we have seen a significant increase in missing incidents due to emotional well-being and mental health. Uh, children going missing due to a desire to self-harm or to suicidal ideation, and that is something that is of real concern to us. It's happening nationally, but it certainly is happening in London. As um, a proportion of missing children in the services that we've spoken to, I don't have the benefit of the uh, access to the, to the very latest missing data um, unless it's in the public domain, um, but we have seen an increase in girls as a proportion of children going missing, um, and black, specifically black children and young people, um, are disproportionately represented in, in missing figures compared with the demographics of the, of the population in general. Um, the average age of children going missing in our services is just slowly decreasing, um, so it seems that children are sometimes, um, whether it be through ex exploitation or some of the other experiences that they have, but, but those are affecting them at a younger age. Um, and then just a couple of bits of information um, that, that were given to us from uh, services working on the ground, some of them actually with uh, Sherry in Safer London. There seems to be, a, there, there are a lot of uh, rumours circulating amongst um, populations of, of young people under the radar about what has happened to certain children, young people who have gone missing, including rumours about abduction, murder, one at least of which that I was told is demonstrably untrue. Um, but because it relates to the profile of a, a missing young person that was relatively high profile. But these, these are creating a climate of fear uh, amongst children and young people about why it might be that certain young people are going missing um, and what the repercussions might be for them of raising that um, with, with the police or with authorities. I also think that the increased use of social media and encrypted messaging, um, increased use of private hire vehicles uh, in exploitation, and the increased use of cryptocurrency make the exploitation that may well be involved with um, missing so much less visible and so much harder to track. So that's a real challenge for us as services. OK, thank you. Sherry, did you want to add to that at all? Not really. I think the only thing around the characteristics of young people that are going missing, I would say we're seeing a disproportionate number of children with learning disabilities and those um, that are neurodiverse are also going missing quite regularly. Um, I think that just makes them more open to grooming. Um, and I, I do definitely, definitely agree that parents sometimes are reluctant to report children missing when they've had negative responses historically. So, but again, we see primarily young people of colour and girls going missing. Yes, I, I, I was astonished by those figures. I'll come to that in a minute. If I can first just ask um, the commander, it, has there been a, a change in the level of demand placed on the Met to respond to incidents of missing children over the last five years? Thank you, Chair and colleagues. Um, I'd say the, the incidences, as, as well rightly clarified a few moments ago, have, have regressed to a, to a mean, so the actual demand is about as it was sort of, th sort of three to five years ago. I think the, some of the successes in this space, we are, according to our latest data from our, our Merlin system and the tracking facilities we have shows that the vast majority of young people do return within 48 hours. Um, uh, Susanna and I were just discussing this before because data from a couple of years ago shows that as being around 60% within 48 hours. Our latest data shows it was over 90%, which in and of itself sounds like a success. I think we must be careful not to over-celebrate that apparent success because in reality we need better data as to how much of that was down to police intervention or partner intervention and how much of it was just that they've returned of their own volition. So it's far from a, far from a success story in its own right and we must always be careful with statistics. Um, I think there's some really key points, if I may, Chair, just to coalesce a few of the previous answers in, into something that, that might help the panel. Um, we, we've already touched on a whole range of issues that are part of the diagnostic drivers behind missing people. So when we talk about, and Sherry and I were speaking just yesterday, and colleagues I'm meeting for the first time here today have echoed it, whether it's online child sex abuse and grooming in that sense, perhaps facilitated by things like crypto exchange, whether it is something like a county lines recruitment into a, into a mule facility for, for an organized criminal gang, whether it is, um, heaven forbid, you know, suicidal ideation or, or self-harm, which is a very different phenomenon, but nevertheless equally harmful and something that we need to work closely with partners to track, um, or whether it is simply young people testing boundaries, whether the boundaries set at home, boundaries within a care facility. 
there's a, there's a whole range of drivers behind missing people and and they're each different and require a very different response um, so from a policing perspective we're working really hard to look at how we take a far more enterprise approach to child safeguarding and look at these things in the round because the danger is sometimes that we can tend to compartmentalize off and look at well that's a county lines matter and that's a self-harm matter and that's a child who repeatedly goes missing because they're going through a rebellious phase and the risks of that are that you misidentify or that we, we miss risks in young people. And whether they return within 48 hours or not, those risks could still be very evident to us. So it really is a case-by-case -case basis. There's a, I just wanted to summarize really, if I may, some of the things that are going through my mind as we're discussing here today and what might assist the discussions. Because each one of those is distinct, but in the round they all pose a threat to children and young people. And how we best get ahead of that threat can only be managed best through a, a multi-agency approach joint work and understand the data and facilities behind that, partnership and diversion activities around those areas such as county lines, such as the work that rescue and response do and other partners around the table, and then of course in times where we do see criminality, enforcement activity from the police if required. Um, but there's, there's an awful lot in there, and those to, summing up back to your question about demand, it depends on which one of those is manifesting, because a child who returns very quickly simply because they're testing the boundaries of their, of their controls is one thing, requires very minimal involvement from the police. So that instance will not require much from us, thankfully. Uh, an instance, obviously, of something like child sexual exploitation, potentially by an organized criminal network, a whole different ball game. And I know this panel in previous sittings has heard about that through the auspices of things like ICSA and so on and so mm. forth. So there's a, there's a wildly different spectrum of police response depending on what we're dealing with. And then a, a similarly different challenge in terms of how we get our arms around those diagnostics in order to ensure that the right and proportionate and most partner-led responses applied. Yes, and, and s there seems to be gaps in this. If I said to you now, as a snapshot, how many children are missing? I don't mean, I mean the ones that have been missing for a, a long while, that are clearly not the, the, the 24, 48 hour ones. How many would you say, it, very roughly, how many would you say that London has? We have roughly 70 children reported missing every single day, Chair. So right now here today... Well, you, OK, take it taking it as a, as a round. Oh. How, what's the core? What is your absolute core of kids that have gone that there's just no trace of? I'm afraid I haven't got that figure for you. I'd have to get it. But I, I can't imagine it's a very high figure because the vast majority do return, as I say, within... 48 hours and that's over 90 percent in fact it's in the high 90 percentages so i'd have to get you that figure separately chair I'm that would be there. really helpful but do you have those figures do you have um children missing over 24 48 etc one week two week, month so you do get those do you have access to all of those figures i i can certainly get it chair i don't have it here to hand today no no i mean yes. it is there so yes. somebody can if and do long, all our do yeah. all the partners have access to this so everybody knows what they're talking about because you can either look at these 26,000 uh, you know overall figures or you can look at the 8,000 figures or it could be that there's 50 that are hardcore missing no trace of I, I think I, we, where we have a missing child over an extended period of time that will often end up being treated as potentially even potentially a homicide thankfully we have nothing in that space at the moment I'm relieved to say and of course as the panel will know we haven't had a, a missing child thankfully turn up deceased in, in quite some time in, in the Met which is a reassurance in some ways again no cause for celebration just a, a positive in the sense that at least we have not had a deceased child but yes if we had an extended missing person situation involving a child that we believe was high risk there's a very real chance we would refer that to our colleagues in the in the homicide command to look at as to whether that potentially is something that that might be a potential fatality in terms of um any the actual hardcore number of those who are missing over say seven days or, or, or beyond that i'd have to get that figure for you separately i'm afraid okay. it will be a low oh. figure though it will be a low figure right well that's what i'm getting at mm. and and at what point is there a flag saying this child has been missing for at what period would you say now this is really worrying what what timeline it depends on the case i'm afraid chair and it depends on those <coughs> underlying drivers that i talked about a moment ago where we have enhanced concerns that could be a very short time scale indeed we, we may go to what we a critical incident almost straight away in a particular incident if we think there are risks of child sexual exploitation or, or, or gang violence or something similar in an instance where we think a child may have run away from a harmful situation and is just determined to stay away from that harmful situation and simply doesn't want to be found then that might be a, might be a, a slower time search for that, that young person to try to make sure we bring them back into safe care. 
Okay. So it does depend on the aggravating factors and those enhanced concerns, I'm afraid. Sorry right. to be imprecise. I'm, ju I'm just trying to get an idea of, of the hardcore amount. Mm. Sherry's hand was up a minute ago. Yeah. Is it yeah, about the figures? Because we're coming about up. The yeah. Figures. yeah, absolutely. Um, at Safer London, at any one time, we're working with somewhere between three and 500 children and young people. We work up to the age of 25. About 70% of the children we work with, 70% um, of the people we work with are children. Um, and we have a sort of need to know alert system. So therefore, if people are repeatedly missing or missing for more than 48 hours, that comes to me um, on a regular basis. And I think out of those three to, to 500 children, I think at the moment we're working with around 370 children. I think at any one time, five of them are either um, long term missing or missing on multiple occasions. So that's just, just to give you a feeling with what's happening with the young people that we're working with at Safer London. That's really helpful, thank you. Uh, Sarah? I think I just wanted to make the point that actually the length of time can sometimes be a red herring. Even if a young person is not missing for a long period of time, it doesn't mean they're not suffering significant harm. And we certainly have known um, cases where Young people have gone missing repeatedly, but possibly for only a couple of days at a time only. Um, but during that time, they have witnessed some really horrific things and experienced some terrible things. And there was a colleague in London who um, spoke to us about, this is not current, this was a couple of years ago, a child who was going missing from school, so has been um, catching the bus to school, not actually... Uh, with their school uniform, not actually then going into school. This was regarded as truanting, wasn't actually even recorded as missing, um, despite the concerns of parents, um, and then would, re would return home at the end of the school day. During that time, that child was being sexually exploited for the whole of the school hours, but apparently it wasn't a, a concerning missing. So I think sometimes we need to be, we need to separate out the time because it's yes, risk uh, and harm that we really need to focus on. No, I accept that unreservedly, but sometimes it's we need to have some sort of comprehension of, of the figures mm. that we're looking at. Um, you mentioned earlier, Sarah, and I, I think the commander did as well, that uh, more girls, um, black ch children respectively, go missing in London. And I've looked at the figures. I mean, there's more black children that go missing than, than, than if I compare it with white, whereas there's... Um, the percentages of, of those in, in, in different um, people in London make up 13% black, 59.8% white. So, I mean, th that, that is staggeringly uh, disproportionate. Is there any reasons that we know about? Has any, uh, any, anything been gone into as to why those families uh, have got particular, this particular problem with their children? Uh, Susanna? Um, it's a really, really good question and one that we're trying to find out. So Missing People, we're doing some research with Listen Up, another organisation, to find out exactly the answer to the question, why, why are black young people so disproportionately represented? Um, and to understand that better. Um, but speaking to other organisations led, led by black people, I think some of the, the questions they're raising which could be part of the answer are the fact that um, black children are more likely to be excluded from school, so they're then at higher risk of exploitation, um, at higher risk of mental health issues. So all of these factors as well as um, racism that they may face and the impact of that on their emotional well-being may well be important factors, but um, we're doing some research to find out you know, exactly what the reasons are um, um, and to try and find out more about the impact on those young people. Well absolutely and also how to start to address it to see mm. if we can help which is the most important thing. Did you want to come back on this Sarah? Just to say absolutely missing people and listen up are doing some excellent work in this field and it's something that we um, perhaps belatedly all of us have become uh, more aware of and uh, it certainly behoves all of us to kind of look more at, at what is uh, going on in that space. I think um, we would just like to raise the issue of adultification of adult children, I mean on the back particularly of child Q perhaps, um, but also of, of um, the experience of some other black children in, in London, that children who are black are not always seen as in need of um, protection. 
um, in the way that white children are. And so I think sometimes they aren't receiving the support that they need to start with. I think there are some community sensitivities as well. We've also had people who've spoken to us about feeling, um, about lacking confidence in reporting their child to the police because they are not convinced that they will get the response that they need and they also fear that they themselves or their families, um, their children could, could get into trouble. Um, now, whether or not those things are justified, and I'm perfectly prepared to accept that, you know, we, we can't just cast aspersions, there needs to be evidence. Um, but the, 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 the confidence is an issue. The fact that people feel this may be the case is important and I think does, does need addressing. Perception is always very important. Yeah. Uh, I'll just come to Assembly Member Moema first. Um, she's had a, or she's asked to speak. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for that response. I just wanted to ask, um, first of all, Met, um, and then other guests, um, you raised the, the point about um, black children being disproportionately excluded and therefore being at risk. Um, whether the MPS feels that they're, they're supported by um, other organisations in London to, um, to prevent children going missing from other statutory services or other statutory providers, we were interested in your views on that. Um, yes, uh, we'll keep that minimal because we're coming on to other sections that that will come in under. Okay. Did you want to answer that, Commander? Uh, if you'd like me to, Chair, yes. yes. Thank you for the question. And I, I think we do have a really positive, supportive and collaborative relationship from most of our partners in this space. Um, I think everyone struggles with the same issues, really, which is the scale of the challenge that faces us. And I say that with compassion for all of my colleagues who've, who've on the statutory provision side and in other areas who are straining under, under the weight of, of incidences and individuals who go missing repeatedly. Um, people, and I'm sure this panel are probably aware of the Operation Philomena protocol, which has been implemented in the Met for some time now, which is where our officers and our missing persons coordinators work really closely with children's care homes in particular. Uh, we know that um, care homes in all forms, whether they're regulated, unregulated, and so on, can often result in, in higher incidences of missing children and repeat MISPAs, working with those care homes to understand um, what they can do to help prevent repeat instances of young people going missing has been productive in terms of, in some instances, with, with joint responsibility agreements, reducing instances of missing from that home by between 30 and 50%. Um, again, with the statistics showing that we've regressed to a mean of about 25 to 26,000, it isn't solving the problem, but it is a good example uh, for, for the Assembly Member's question of times when we have worked really productively in partnership with certain homes to have a really sensible and mature approach to how and when children are reported missing and to managing the risk that they may be in. Okay. Um, we're coming to some of that later, so I think I'll stop that. I just had a quick indication from Assembly Member Best. Thank you, Chair. It was just quickly, um, Sarah, to follow up on your point just then, you were um, you spoke about the adoption of black children and how it means that some of them aren't getting the support that they need. Could you uh, be more specific about the organisations, community groups uh, or bodies that you believe are not providing the support they should be? I don't think any of us are. I, th I, think, I think that's an issue that all of us need to um, confront honestly and it, we need to be aware of it. And I, I think um, I am reluctant uh, to, to name specific organisations, partly because actually I'm not based in London um, and although Catch-22 have services in London with whom I've extensively consulted, um, I, I don't think it would be very helpful perhaps to say that. But I did attend a really good... Um, session in 2021 by Afruka, which was looking at the issue of missing children, and it was an issue which came up repeatedly from um, members of the black community who I think probably w would be the, the better people to ask about that. Um, so I'm sorry to chicken out with that, <laughs> with, with that answer, but I think genuinely it's something that is an issue for for all of us. I think it's, it's an, an emerging issue that... Um, should be a real challenge to any of us working to protect children. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we're running very late on this particular section. I've seen uh, Sherry Peck has indicated if it could mm. just be kept on the data, etc. really. Ah, okay. I was going to pick up on the adultification issue and say that I think it's a um, across-the-board failure to recognise 
children of colour and black children. The adultification is a massive, massive issue. And the other thing I would say is, is that we've got children, everybody should be understanding um, the context that we're asking our children to grow up in. It's absolutely brutal. And until the unfairness that's inherent in the system is changed and actually um, changed quite dramatically, the issues are always going to remain for children. Okay. So you know, the work of Professor Carleen Furman should be understood by everybody. Okay, thank you. Assembly Member Ahmed, briefly. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I am deeply concerned, <clears throat> again, about the issue of specifically black African Caribbean children being overrepresented in these figures. And I think, Sarah, you talked about girls um, having a particular issue. And as you said, on the back of child queue and the strip and the disproportionate strip searches, uh, intimate strip searches of black children. Um, this is yet another issue that has come up where black children, particularly black girls, are um, disproportionately affected. Could you very briefly so I know, I know you didn't want to answer earlier, but could you very briefly outline what you think needs to happen here? Um, one thing I would really advocate is that we listen to children. I mean, I, I'm delighted that you've invited us here, and I think we've all spoken about the importance of multi-agency working, and it's something that we need to do together. Um, but, you know, children are the ones who can tell you, those black children can tell you what their experiences are. And I just don't think their voice is out there enough. Um, so I think, I, I, I'm sure there are some brilliant young people who would be able to come and speak to you. And you would benefit enormously by just really listening to their experiences. I know I would. I'd love to be, um, I'd love to be able to come along too. But those young people um, have regular experiences of um, just, just perhaps almost um, invisible exclusions, microaggressions, um, just sort of daily um, discriminatory acts, which actually cumulatively have a real impact for them over time. Um, and as I say, I think we, I hope that some recent events, which have been tragic, have also served for us as a, as a wake up call. And on the back of the very negative experiences of some children, that we're all much more attuned to that now. And it's about time. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you. So, Chair, would it be possible for us to organise some kind of session like well, I'm, that? I'm going to go on to that. Thank because, you. Um, I, I think we'll get to the end of the meeting and realise there's a whole lot more, but let, let's see how we go. I'm going to move on now to protecting vulnerable children, which is going to be led by Assemblymember Garrett. Good morning. So, um, we've touched on this a bit already, but just focusing in particularly on that cohort of children who go missing, who have some serious risk factors such as you know links with county lines links with you know known links with child sexual exploitation and, and so on um, thinking particularly about that cohort of children that go missing um, what are the the key challenges in, in sort of preventing those kinds of children from, from going missing as opposed to the more you know general population which I think commander you, you mentioned earlier so I can start with you commander but particularly thinking about those more vulnerable children that we're more concerned about what are the challenges in preventing those from going missing Thank you very much. Uh, the challenges in, in areas such as county lines have been recognised for some time, and, and as this panel will know from, from previous assemblies, I'm sure there's been some, some genuine successes in tackling the organised criminal gangs who are actually generally responsible for the, for the modern slavery, if you like, the recruitment of these young people into county lines rackets where they're, where they're being forced to, to smuggle drugs across borders or indeed across London or elsewhere. Um, the diversionary tactics in that uh, stepped some time away ago from any sort of move to criminalise those children far more into a diversionary pathway where we sort of look to divert them away from that county lines work. Uh, the work of rescue and response, which is a commissioned service by MOPAC, is really fundamental to that. And Will and I were just talking beforehand about the need to make sure we drive up our police referrals into that, that capability so that we can try to divert young people away from a life as a county lines uh, victim. Um, but long since have we, have we stopped prosecuting people in that space, unless, of course, there is clear evidence of willful criminality. We recognise these children as vulnerable rather than criminals. So there's been a step change there some time ago, and that has yielded some good dividend in terms of both bringing young people into a safer lifestyle. Um, there have been roughly about 20 young children a year have been recovered from county lines phenomenon uh, and brought back to, to, a, to a, safe, a safe lifestyle um, without them being criminalised. Um, and that's been repeated over the last few years and those numbers are rising. 
I think more broadly in areas such as child sexual exploitation, there continues to be the, the, the ever-present risk of, of adults who, who would seek to to exploit children for, for sexual gratification. We've seen evidence of this in other areas. We, we're currently working on the recommendations from the Telford CSE uh, inquiry report, and of course we have previous watershed reports in this space, including ICSA and others. Um, the challenge there, as we know, is that people who seek to groom in that sense will tend to do so often online and in very surreptitious and insidious ways. And the trick for us there is to make sure that our online investigative posture through our OXA teams, our online child sex abuse and exploitation teams, is as vigorous as it can be in order to target the offenders and bring them to justice. I'm pleased to say that in this last week's HMI report that was commented on by HMI as being a reducing risk for our organisation because our detections and our enforcement in that space has been increasing steadily for some time thanks to the great work of, of our colleagues in Central Specialist Crime. So there's a big piece in there for us, police as there would be about enforcement against the gangs responsible for criminality and sexual exploitation. There's then, of course, the partnership piece around once we identify those children and young people at risk is how we divert them. And that's where we're grateful again to, to the colleagues to my left and to many other statu uh, statutory and non-statutory agencies who assist us in those diversionary pathways. I think, if I may just go back to a point that uh, um, Assemblymember Ahmed mentioned a moment ago about young people and disproportionality in terms of those figures, which is quite germane here, I think, is that I, I would almost query in a way how concerned we should be about the, that difference in the statistics. Slightly controversial as that might sound, because when young people and children are going missing, we want to know about that. Going missing is, in itself is not a crime. We need to know as police and partners if a young child is missing so we can help recover them. The last thing I want is those figures to drop and children of any demographic to be at risk. So I'd much rather they went up in many ways so I know, so that we have the opportunity to intercede, and particularly, sir, if they've got a criminal gang of any hue who's trying to exploit them so that I can tackle them and bring them to justice with my colleagues. Thanks. I don't know. Uh, if, uh, I was going to say, if we, I think it probably is a question lots of people want to comment on. So if we go all the way along, w Will, about specifically about those children yeah, with a risk uh, factor. I mean, thanks. You're talking about the most, most vulnerable children here. And um, unfortunately, we don't have our, safe, our social care colleague with us. But I think the work that we're doing in the safeguarding space is really important here as well, because what we want to do is prevent young people uh, um, who are exhibiting early vulnerabilities um, from, from being exploited. Um, I mean, an interesting, an interesting point on disproportionality as well is many of these children going missing, a very high proportion are looked after children. And uh, there's a strange disproportionate anomaly in children's social care that social care colleagues, if they were here, would talk about more, which is uh, black and uh, females are overrepresented in the social care population versus what happens in early help, which is the, the pre. So basically, you're more likely to be put into the care system and less likely to receive an early help intervention. So that does go some way to explaining the disproportionality in the figures. Uh, it also goes some way to explaining some of the other disproportionality that Kevin was referring to too, because those vulnerable members of our society aren't receiving the discretionary services um, that are available for others. We're trying really hard at City Hall to do loads about that. So a really important place is, is the work that we're doing with um, safeguarding leaders across London. So there's a there's a safeguarding executive that I sit on, but I particularly like to talk about the adult, uh, sorry, the adult, the adolescent safeguarding forum, which MOPAC and the VRU are really close to, and that's looking at something called contextual safeguarding. So for teenagers, uh, this idea of contextual safeguarding, everything that's going on in your lives, and Sherry uh, uh, and if our, our London Rescue Response partners here will tell you way more about this, but um, is absolutely vital. So we, what we need is whole community protective responses to the most vulnerable young people. We've got, to, we've got to stop them progressing and those vulnerabilities increasing. That's a lot of the stuff the VRU does. That in itself will, present, will prevent young people from, from uh, becoming the victims of uh, criminal exploitation, gangs, or, or, or other forms of abuse. Okay, thank you. Susanna, so specifically thinking about those children with a vulnerability, what are the challenges in, in stopping them from going missing? I think the biggest challenge in preventing those young people going missing is that we know that they have been groomed incredibly deeply and over a long time. So um, the draw, the pull of the exploiter is so strong because of the threat that they know that they and their family face if, if they don't do what they are being told they must do. Um, so preventing them going missing in the first place might be really hard, but I think the most important thing is to see a first missing episode as perhaps the, the, the first sign of exploitation. It's perhaps the most common sign of exploitation and the response to that to try and intervene before that exploitation gets 
entrenched. So return home interviews, which I know we'll speak about later, are a really important part of that picture, but also making sure that something happens after them. So one of the services we run, not in London, but um, I'm sure there's other services similar, and um, perhaps Catch-22 run, of, of not just providing a return home interview, but providing ongoing intensive support um, to a young person to, to help them um, avoid getting totally entrenched and, and, and um, help them get themselves out of the situation that they're in. But I'd also say the role of parents and carers is incredibly important here. Um, we work with um, parents of missing children every day and sometimes they, they know their child best, they know when they're concerned and sometimes they don't feel listened to when they're reporting those concerns to the police because they might not know the right words to use of course around exploitation but they're really concerned and, and seeing them as partners in safeguarding and involving them effectively in the solutions is, is another important um, way of preventing this becoming uh, a repeat and, and, and very risky experience for the child and their family. Yeah, I mean, the, the grooming point is a good one. I read an autobiography of a girl who had been exploited, and it was only very many years later that she came to understand that this man, she was, I think, 13 or 14, he was in his 20s, that he wasn't her boyfriend, and she was, you know, going missing, in inverted commas, running away to spend time with him, and her parents found it impossible to stop her leaving. She uh, was, you know, literally climbing out of her bedroom window, um, and then the su they found the so social services uh, either found it difficult or, in some cases, were just unwilling to to, to, to stop that relationship. So that's, I mean, are we? I mean, that was, I think, it would be ten or fifteen years ago that that was happening, and not in London. It was up in in Yorkshire. So d do we think we're better now at stopping that kind of relationship? Is that because obviously that's it's an obvious red flag when you read about it. You know, when she writes her autobiography in her twenties. But I can see that it's difficult to stop it happening at the time. I think, I think uh, as professionals, we're better at recognising it, for sure. Um, I think it's still, it's, still, it's still a big issue. We know that from, from the figures, the, the numbers of young people being sexually and criminally exploited. Um, it's really difficult because of, because of the, the added challenges and the, of, you know, the threats and the risks that they face if they don't comply. Um, but I think the other thing that I want to say is that at Missing People, we've got two services that can really help young people. We've got our runaway helpline service um, and also a safe call service, which is particularly for victims of county lines exploitation and their families, um, as both as really early intervention um, opportunities and we can help young people think through what's going on for them um, around relationships, around exploitation but also help get them safe if that's what they need in that moment as well thanks sorry sarah just again on that question about you know preventing those particularly more vulnerable children going missing i i will try not to speak for half an hour just to point you to um just to give some background and and you were talking about the book that you read um mm. sky news picked up a really good story on monday night and then there was file on four on radio four tuesday night and i really commend those to you um just because it's a particular story of one girl and actually interestingly it also talks about the use of the nrm so that might be something that you'd like to consider there um and they've done a much better job than i could do um in terms of individuals, um, the huge vulnerability that is intractable, as far as I'm concerned, is where young people have experienced very, very um, distressing early childhood um, trauma. Uh, there may be developmental trauma, relational trauma, a whole range of experiences, and that can leave such a hole in the life of the child. And that hole, regardless of how good carers can be, how wonderful social care might be in supporting them, that hole stays. And if we are not filling that with good things, with good activities, with good people, then somebody else will. And it's such a challenge. And we see children who, um, who are exploited, who are then supported to um, understand and to leave that exploitation, but for whom that vulnerability stays, and then several years later, might, that might then happen to them again, and it might then be a pattern that's set up for unhealthy relationships into adult life. It is a huge challenge, and I cannot um, understate, overstate, really, the amount of uh, resource that needs to go into that. Um, 
the other thing I would say is that we focus on the child here, you know, the, the, the child, what, you know, what's going on with the child. I'd actually just like to talk about some structural wider issues as well, because I think some of the issues that we are looking at now um, will be real drivers um, for exploitation. And we need to be very aware of, for example, the, the cost of living crisis, the impact that will have on people living in poverty, driving uh, more families into poverty, because I think that the... The responsibility some children feel to make money to support their families when they can see what's happening um, is, I think this is a real danger point. Um, I also think that um, I'm very grateful that you mentioned contextual safeguarding because that's the thing about looking at the risk that is uh, in the environment in which the child is growing up rather than always focusing on the child and that's what we need to do because when a child is released from custody, um, when a child is rescued in the rescue and response services, then they come back to the same place, to the same risk, to the same level of threat. And one of the most intractable and difficult situations is the whole thing about def debt bondage. If a child is in debt bondage, what do we do? There is no legal and ethical way of, of dealing with that. But then that leaves that child incredibly exposed and in real danger, I mean, sometimes mortal danger. So. I, I, I just put that out there. I have, no, I have absolutely no solution, but I think the, it is very important to uh, highlight that. And then I think I did talk earlier about the, the rumours that circulate, the level of threat and fear that is all happening underneath the radar. And we, we know, anecdotally, the huge numbers of, of children who carry knives. And that's because they're fearful. But ironically, it makes them less safe. And so somehow we need to really invest in this generation who've been doubly impacted because they've also had the impact of COVID. And, you know, I, I, uh, I know, I recognise I'm talking um, in a week when how m multi billions have been wiped off the British economy. I recognise how difficult it is. But the one cut I think can't be made is for our children, young people in London. Thank you. And I saw that, Sherry, you had your hand up as well to come in on that question. Yes, please. Um, I think it's really safe for London's bread and butter. So as I said earlier, we're working at any one time with three to 500 of children that are, have got some of the most complex lives in London. We have a presence in every London borough. Our work has recently independently been evaluated and it says that we have a statistical significance in reducing levels of victimisation. More than 50% of the children when they leave us feel that they are no longer victims to the set of circumstances they were already in. We have a statistical significance on moving children away from criminality. It's not as high as I want it to be and we're always striving for more. And your question initially was, what do we have to do to work with children to move them to that point? Um, there are three sort of things that underpin our work. So first of all, you don't get beyond interview stage at Safer London if you um, think that the answer might be criminalising children. We safeguard children rather than criminalise them. The whole thing around contextual safeguarding, it underpins what we do. Safer London is currently being evaluated by a university about being one of the first uh, stat um, non-statutory organisations to embed contextual safeguarding into our approaches. And the last thing is, is that we really think that the victim perpetrator divide is really unhelpful. You know, there aren't a group of children that are victims and a group of children that are perpetrators. If you look across the board, many of these children that would be perceived by your average Daily Mail reader as the perpetrator, when you unpick just slightly, reinforcing what other people on the panel have said, these children are very often victims and carry huge amounts of developmental trauma and live in very brutal contexts. So what do we do? I mean, all of Safer London staff are credible professionals. You might hear other organisations talk about um, employing people with lived experience, et cetera, et cetera. At Safer London, we don't believe that's enough. They have to be credible professionals that can engage with children for anything between six months up to two years, which I know makes our commissioners eyes water, but the evidence shows that sometimes it can take that long to work with young people. The first thing we do is we secure their physical safety. Um, and that's about them being able to navigate safely through the place where they live and sometimes it also means that we need to move children and families and we, we're quite successful at doing that but it's a huge disruption for the whole family after that we pick up on 
um, secure and emotional safety for young people. Some of them have severe mental health problems, but almost every child that lives amongst violence, we know that that will impact on their emotional well-being. So we do huge amounts of work around emotional safety and emotional intelligence and emotional self-care. We know, and any of us would be foolish to think that peer networks are only negative or not important. We know that the value of peers to young people is critical. And so what we do is we work with them to build healthy peer networks. We make sure they understand their own needs in relationships and that they can secure those own, own needs and they can recognize negative and positive friendships and learn how to navigate out of that. And then I think the last thing we do is that we really try not to allow children to leave us until they've got some sort of future focus um, and that they're, they're quite clear on what's going forward. And that might be that they've got strong financial planning skills, that they know what they want to do for a living. They may have found the passion that will drive them that isn't becoming the next Marcus Rashford or Stormzy. You know, it's a realistic passion and they've got some clear drivers to to um, future focus. And that seems to be having a positive outcome for children that are living complex lives in, in London. We don't do any of that alone, and we do rely on partners, and partners are under enormous stress, whether that's the police, social care, or other voluntary sector organisations. It's absolutely critical that we recognise that that stress is in existence. And we also do it embedded in communities. So there's a real place for small voluntary organisations in a place. So there's an amazing organisation in London, St Matthews, that run football clubs in parts of South London that do incredible work and that's really, really valuable. And we always step children down into strong local connections like that. So you were looking for solutions and I think we've got bits and pieces of that. Certainly haven't got the whole answer, but we certainly have got some of the solutions and happy to share more information about that if you need it. Thank you. Thanks everyone. It's a very complex and difficult question. I appreciate it. I think that was some quite useful uh, discussion. So th thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Actually, I want to take this opportunity to uh, welcome Year 13 students from the London Academy of Excellence in Tottenham. Uh, you're observing the meeting. Hi. Um, we're talking today about missing children and or young adults. Often they will be of your age and you will hear very many of the uh, people speaking today saying just how important it is that if friends of people that go missing are there for them if they can point them to services that will actually help them. Because missing children is something that we, we all wished there weren't any at all. So if you have any friends that are likely to go missing, you could be that one connection that will stop them moving away from home or, or getting themselves into any trouble. So please listen, because a lot of this could actually affect you or some of your friends. And thank you very much for coming. We do appreciate it. Um, Assemblymember Ahmed, did you still want to come in on the back of that question? I, I did, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I think we know that children seeking asylum are particularly vulnerable to exploitation. And in August, we heard from the Home Office itself that um, children were going missing. They, these children were going missing at the rate of one a week from Home Office accommodation. The Nationality and Borders Act, which was passed in April, has actually been criticised for being discriminatory against this group of children based on their national um, and nationality and immigration status. What work is being done to address the specific needs of these children? And I'm going to ask Commander Southwark about that, please. Thank you, Assembly Member. I'm not aware of any. Oh, I'm sorry. That's one of the questions that I'm asking. Uh, we'll proceed, Assembly Member Ahmed, if you could go through. through. So, so, yes, if you if you could answer, it was on the the list for later. But um, apologies to Assembly Member Russell. If you could answer, we'd still be grateful. Thank you. Mm, certainly, Chair. Um, thank you to you both. I don't have a statistic for that, so apologies. I'd have to come back to you with a stat. Um, what I would say is that this issue of people with potentially vulnerable immigration status has come up in different types of crime and criminality, and indeed it will feature, no doubt, in this as well, in terms of missing persons, which, as we've identified before, isn't being a crime in itself. It's a vulnerability. 
Um, I think the key thing for us is that in all such things, we take a child first approach. So if we came across a child, a young person who was missing and we believed certainly at risk, and it turned out at the same time they were potentially of, of insecure immigration status, recovering them first and foremost would be step one. Um, and then ultimately any considerations thereafter with UKBA or, or, or with uh, the Immigration Service will be, will be a separate consideration altogether. Um, we determinedly uh, disaggregate the two. And we have a similar situation when it comes to um, wanted missing young people who have been reported missing. We treat them as a missing person first, and then second after that, if they're wanted for a crime, we'll deal with that in a secondary, secondary faculty. So that is something which we've made clear as policy to all of our officers and staff. Um, in terms of more detail behind that, I'd have to come back to you if you wanted statistics, I'm afraid. Uh, it, it wasn't statistics, it was actually about strategy. Mm -hmm, certainly. Um, and and Seth, Sarah, did you have anything to say about that? It's not something actually that I personally um, have dealt with um, very much, so I'm not going to say a lot. I mean, just to point you to um, a, an excellent ECPAT report that's just been produced called um, Outside the Frame, which talks about the uh, exactly raises the concerns around the nationality and borders bill, um, but also talks about children who are being accommodated in hotels. Now, I, I fully appreciate the enormous, there's no social care here, but they would tell you the enormous, enormous pressure that there is on accommodation, um, and particularly in London because of the, the, the prices. Um, but it is completely inappropriate that any, any child should be placed, um, an accompanied child should be placed in hotel accommodation. And clearly, that, that does make them much more vulnerable. And then when a child who's been trafficked into the UK goes missing, those are the children whom we never, uh, whom we sometimes never find again. That's a poor grammar in that sentence, but you know, those might be the ones who, who go missing um, and will never resurface. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Assembly Member Russell. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, so, um, picking back up, um, uh, th th uh, Commander Southworth, um, what is the main challenge for the Met with children who are missing from care, and is there sufficient coordination, information sharing between the Met and carers to tackle those particular challenges? Uh, thank you for the question. It's a, a, a real mainstay of our approach to um, safeguarding young children from, from the risk of missing and uh, a risk of repeating something of what I said before, I hope you'll indulge me, the work under Operation Philomena to work jointly with care homes in order to ensure that we have the best possible operating practices is central to everything that we do in this space. The joint responsibility agreements which have been established with, I'm just going to get the stat for you now because I've got it in front of me here, it's, it's over just under 400 care homes across the city with whom we have agreements whereby, and not all those are regulated care homes, there are, are, are 100 and 35 regulated care homes and we calculate about 535 unregulated care homes within that and roughly 300 well let's say roughly 377 of those we have a joint responsibility agreement with um, 312 of which are in the unregulated space so that shows really good engagement from those you know as I say over 370 care homes in terms of working with us to ensure that they don't just report one minute past curfew time a, a child a young person who perhaps goes missing regularly but they take a circumspect approach as to what they might be able to identify as, as, as whether they are missing and at risk or not. But simultaneously, where obviously we see repeat missing persons from that care setting, then we have the opportunity to engage our missing persons coordinator with them, to try and take a problem solving approach, have a strategy meeting with other statutory partners and NGOs, see if we can divert that young person away from that frequent missing person behavior, working jointly with the care home facility. So I think there's some good examples in there of good best practice working multi-agency and particularly with the care homes themselves. I think the wider landscape of care settings is something that poses us all a challenge. And I think the very increased ratios that we see of children going missing from care relative to children going missing from home will test us all for some time to come. Um, and that's not solely down to, as um, colleagues of mine in this space advise me, some of the unregulated care homes give fantastic support. Um, it's, it's not a case of a binary issue of Ofsted regulated are all the best and unregulated aren't. But there is clearly a, a, com a compulsion on us to try and make sure we have as much regulation in place as possible. Secure placements and, of course, out of, out of London placements are another challenge as well. And, of course, moving people from within one 
local authority area to another, particularly young people displacing them, is another challenge, all of which can add up to those diagnostic drivers behind which we see young people going missing from care settings because they've been displaced out of their area and detached from their friends and so on and so forth. So there are lots of different facets of that. But that's central to it is us working jointly with those care homes and with our local authority partners, LSCP partners, to try and make sure we don't unnecessarily displace young children. Or when we do, we put them in a setting which is safer than the one we remove them from. Yeah. So did you say there were 312 unregulated care homes that you'd been engaging with through Indeed. the Philomena yes. protocol? Um, and so does the, the... So would you say that that Philomena protocol is is helping in terms of improving practice in, I mean, I'm sure there are lots of unregulated care homes with very good practice and great people working there, um, but th presumably there's more concern around the unregulated care homes than there is around regulated care homes. I mean, I'm not an expert in that space in terms of what Ofsted colleagues will do to, to regulate and vet those, those care home facilities. You'd have to, forgive me, ask other partners or, or Ofsted themselves. But I think probably all of us from a common sense perspective would, would certainly welcome greater regulation so we, we have that safeguard in place because regulation is a, a necessary safeguard for us, isn't it? Um, so I, I, it's, a, it's a rather clumsy yes to that, I think. Um, but at the same time, I, I certainly wouldn't want to suggest that you know all of the unregulated care homes are not doing a good job because, as I say, we've got th over 300 of them engaging with us under Operation Philomena, and we really welcome that because I'm sure that you know, colleagues in this space will attest the challenges there are particularly difficult for providing all of that care home capability and capacity for young people. So there's probably only so much my local authority colleagues and LSCP and others can do to actually provide those places. Um, given the amount of funding and resource constraints they may face. So I'm, I'm trying to be sympathetic to their cause there, whilst at the same time acknowledging your point, which is that clearly we'd rather they were all regulated and we'd mm -hmm. rather they were all under Philomena and we'd rather we had a free-flowing access to secure placements for those who really need it. Unfortunately, as a society, we're not actually in that space at the moment. Uh, and I welcome this panel's support mm -hmm. and others in terms of how we can perhaps force that issue. Susanna, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I think just want to recognise that that is some really good practice happening there, especially because it sounds like it's an ongoing relationship. So police officers li continually liaising with those care homes about is the right support in place for each young person. Um, so that's great. I guess the, just a, a note of caution of, of, for care homes that are pa perhaps under-reporting children as missing when they are at risk because you rightly mentioned there is some over-reporting, but we know there can also be under-reporting with the carers not recognising the risks and not reporting young people as missing. But also just picking up on a point around out-of-area placements. Of mm -hmm. course, we all know accommodation in London is so expensive that a lot of London young people um, are in care in other areas, and that creates real issues when they go missing around responsibility for return home interviews, which may mean that those young people are less likely to get a return home interview. But also, there's real challenges for the local authorities and police in, in both areas of information sharing um, and making sure the right support's in place for that young person. Um, and we know that those young people are also more likely to go missing because they want to see friends and family back home as well. So that's a particular challenge, I think, for London in this space around care of the, the proportion who are out of area and the challenges that that creates for the services that support them. Now, I wonder if I could bring Beverly in here and welcome to the, to the well, uh, the chair can welcome, but um, welcome to the meeting. But to hear from someone from um, you're from the London Borough of ha Haringey, um, uh, and I just wonder if there's anything that you would like to see sort of improving between the way the local authorities work with the Met and with other partners in terms of um, supporting particularly children placed out of borough um, who are at risk of going missing. Thanks very much. Uh, and I do want to endorse the, um, the commendation that was just uh, echoed by Susanna around the principles of the Philomena Protocol, where we've seen it work, and it works really well. And it doesn't just address the individual um, uh, trigger uh, uh, 
assessments of the children who may be at risk in particular homes, but also reinforces the confidence of the key workers to, and the way that they work with some of the most vulnerable children, whether that's in an unregulated or regulated setting. The reg unregulated point, I know that Ofsted have a plan, um, and no doubt um, the separate note can be shared on it. Our biggest challenge as practice leaders is, is really about children who, for good reasons, may have to be placed out of local authority. And the disconnection between the forces in sharing information, the different governance arrangements, the different pathways, the different processes that are followed. Um, and we, one of our concerns is, is with all the best intent, because when we, when we work with our officers, they do a sterling job but it's the delay in getting that engagement for children who are placed out of their resident authorities. And that, of course, intensifies the risks because your local maces don't have access to the data in the area that they're placed in. We may be told uh, have profile risk assessments, but that's uh, limited. Um, and we don't have access to the resources to intervene, prevent episodes happening again, and also to ensure that the local authorities care package is robust in the locality that they're placed in and very dependent upon the care provider as a single agency to discharge that corporate responsibility for us so when you say the care provider you mean the the, home. the homes yeah. yeah thank you and that's presumably when you find yourselves using unregulated homes is do you have less kind of reassurance on that or I mean, I think the Ofsted um, uh, direction of travel to move to regulating all provision for children um, and young people is the right one, uh, the, the sector, and my colleagues across London would support that. It's the uh, unintended consequences that may occur when you're dealing with a hugely complex and complicated landscape that feels um, very much out of the line of sight for some of the practice leaders and the, the staff. Uh, and I think an opportunity to share intelligence um, uh, across the force, not just the Met. I think the Met has a critical role for us, and they do um, uh, lead in many of those discussions. But we, across the, the forces, would, is the missing piece. We, uh, we don't know what we don't know. Thank you. Um, Sarah, I can see you nodding. Did, you, do, did that mean you wanted to add something briefly? Or just to, I mean, I absolutely reiterate all, all of the things that we've heard. It's absolutely our experience, too, that, that the difficulty across borders is that things are then stored on different databases. Um, uh, obviously, that's also the case in the UK with police, that police databases don't speak to each other. One specific issue I'd just like to mention in relation to missing um, and the, the whole complicated care landscape is that if a child goes missing across a local um, authority or a police force border, there are then issues about whose responsibility that child is and who picks that up. And we have had members of the ECRC who have reported to us that um, the local police force from the area from which the child went missing won't accept the missing report because they say, well, they're now missing in another area, whereas the other area police force will not accept the report because they say, well, the child is not one of our children, they're from somewhere else. And that means that nobody is effectively accepting that report, looking for that child. And then when that child does return, they don't either get any of the uh, support and intervention that a, a child should get on returning from missing. Mm -hmm. Would either MOPAC or the Met, d do you want to respond to the point about when children go missing across borders and there's a disjuncture in terms of who takes responsibility. <laughs> Sorry, too many gentlemen. Perhaps I'll, we'll, well, hopefully we'll, we'll I'll, go I'll compliment each other. We were actually just comparing notes. Forgive me, panel. I've, I've got the breakdown here of the, the, the layout that I understand as best I can of the unregulated and regulated care homes across different local authority areas within London. And we were just noting that, you know, it is a, a very significant volume of the care homes, both regulated and unregulated, and areas, of course, where the real estate is cheaper. Um, and, of course, we see that as a, as a driving phenomenon, because what that means is if you're in one of the very central inner London boroughs and you have a child who requires placing in a care home, there's a high likelihood you're going to get placed out into one of the outer regions. Now, if you're a young person who's been moved maybe because of you've been involved in a gang or something similar, then the risk there is you get put into an area where you may be in, in gang tension with another another 
group of young gang members and therefore that's more likely to make you want to go missing from that care setting. A simple example I know, but a very real one when it talks about how we move children and young people across the city. And the statistics I've got here show that if you take um, our South Area Command, which is, has one of our biggest missing persons challenges, they've got a, a very high number of care homes compared to, say, Al Alpha Whiskey, which is our central London area, including sort of Westminster and, and Kensington and Chelsea. Now, you would expect that, I know. But the outcome of that, the corollary of that, is that we're going to see more movement of children and young people out of the home local authority, depending on, on, on the actual real estate price, as mm -hmm. much as anything. And then the challenge within that is, as I say, how does that displace them from their peers? How does that potentially put them in contact with other risks? And then when we start to talk unregulated care homes, and I was quick, as you know before, to make sure we signpost that many of them have really good working practices with us. The known unknown in this is that where children are being underreported or not reported to us, then that, of course, poses us with very real and insuperable risks because I don't know what the risk is. It goes back to my point before to Assembly Member Ahmed about the fact that I, we need to be careful trying to reduce these figures in any area. If, if children are missing, they're missing, and, and we want to know about it. Yeah, thank you. So my, my final question goes back to the uh, trafficked and unaccompanied children going missing from care. And I just wonder if, um, uh, Susanna perhaps to start with, but if anyone else wants to comment on what more um, the, the partners, the, the local authorities, the police and, and other partners um, can do to ensure those trafficked and unaccompanied children that go missing from care seek help. Thank you. And um, Sarah mentioned earlier some ECPAT research. We've done three pieces of um, research with ECPAT UK on this topic around trafficked and unaccompanied children going missing from care. And as you'll all be aware, the numbers are staggering. One in three trafficked children went missing from care in 2020. And that's national at London statistics, I should say. That's an increase of 25%. And one in eight unaccompanied children. Now, we know there's some real issues here, of course, that um, often the, the traffickers, the people that have brought them um, to the UK will be telling them not to trust any professionals here. So that's a real challenge from the, from the start for professionals who are trying to support them. Um, but also there's, there's a real role here for independent child trafficking guardians, which I know are in place, I think, um, delivered by Bernardo's across London to help build up that trust with the young person as soon as they arrive because we know often they go missing really quickly. The other thing that I think is, is so important is to make sure those young people as soon as they arrive get information in their own language perhaps voiced by someone that they you know would would recognize as, as um, being someone from their own country and their own culture to explain to them what's going to happen to them and why and what support is available and what will happen if they access that support because there's such a understandable fear of of all agencies and and what will happen and and so one of our biggest frustrations is that this is such a big group of children going missing but they rarely contact us at missing people and runaway helpline um, and we know that that's probably because they are afraid of, of what will happen if they do. Um, so that's an issue that, that we're trying to address at Missing People. Thank you. Does any, um, I mean, I'm aware Sherry hasn't come in from online uh, for mm. a while. Is there anything you'd like to add on this point? No, I, I think for me, one of the bigger issues for, for certainly trafficked and unaccompanied uh, children is at that point position of transitioning into adulthood and the fear they have about what that may mean for their status and sadly we've worked in the past year with two or three um, young people so as they've turned 18 that have become very involved in criminal gangs and in fact came across our first case of a, a young man having his organs harvested um, to pay off debts etc so I think um, that we should absolutely be focused on children and young people, but that transitioning into young adulthood is where things can go desperately, desperately wrong at this point. Um, and I'm not an expert in that, but we're seeing more and more young people being coerced into serious organised crime when they have no other adults or systems to support them um, because of their, their, their um, immigration status. Yeah. 
Thank you. That's absolutely, absolutely shocking. Um, there was just one um, thing that I wanted to pick up on what um, Susanna had said, but actually it has completely disappeared from my brain, so I'm going to hand straight back to Susan. I'll, I'll, I'll take it back straight away, time and reasons. Um, Beverly Hendricks, you've, you arrived in the middle of that. I'm so sorry you've had a terrible journey trying to get here. Getting to this place, as every single Assembly member, bar one, will tell you, is a nightmare. So thank you to all the others who managed it, and I'm so sorry you had a problem. Right, we're now going over, and can we be mindful of the time, guests, please, because it's, it's such an important subject we tend to talk on about it which which I'm grateful for uh, but we, we must keep to time assembly member Bakari thank you chair um, I just wanted to pick up on some of the uh, areas that uh, assembly um, uh, member Russell was just talking about on in terms of uh, the way local authorities are working with uh, police and partners etc um, and also uh, on the looked after children outside of London. Firstly, um, as an experienced teacher, I, find, I feel like the conversation with the panel has missed a really important aspect that I've not picked up on anybody's mentioning yet, and that is the work that you're doing with schools. So I'd like to know exactly specifically what you're doing, because as a teacher myself, I always felt as if we were completely left in the dark, and there were really, really vital bits of information that we had as teachers that were just not being communicated to the right people and we found it very frustrating working with local authorities and social services what has improved since my time in teaching was only a few years ago I'll just make one comment, which is not going to answer your question, so I apologise. Um, but an ex-teacher, so I absolutely know where you're coming from. Um, I I'd just like to make the point that actually the work with schools is often the kind of the prevention, early intervention work, um, as well as you say you, there might be specific con concerns that you want to raise. And I would just really put a plea here that commissioners consider that, because when budgets are straightened um, and it's difficult to cover all the things. We know we can't cut crisis intervention, so it is upstream that we cut those services. Um, and so you ask for Catch-22, you know, what might we be doing in schools? Actually, in our services in London, very little, because that's not what our commissioners are asking for. Um, so it's a, a very important point. Beverly, do you want to come in I here? Do. Cause I I, can, I I was slightly critical of local authorities there, and I'd like to hear from you. Well, constructive criticism is, is always welcomed. Yes. <laughs> um, so it, from our experience, uh, um, and I've canvassed the, the, the views of um, the North Central London ADs uh, and, of course, the wider practice leads from London councils, we feel that we understand the critical importance of the school community being very much a part of the systems we have in place around any vulnerability, but never more so since um, the post-COVID measures um, uh, that we have now. So if I illustrate by the um, examples provided to me from the boroughs I consulted before coming here, uh, we know that they are some of our head teachers have designates and champions involved in our MACE. The MACE is the strategic board that reports to our safeguarding partnerships across adults and children, um, and they have a voice. Uh, they're not just coming to the uh, table, they are, on, they are forming the agenda and sharing information with the revision, within the framework and the revisions to the Working Together 2018 that permits them to do so. Some of the challenges are that the schools want more information than we can legitimately provide um, and I think some of the tensions are caused there and I think the Commission may want to um, consider how we would be given more liberty to share information that keeps children safe with the work of the safer neighborhood police in the schools. Uh, so although we have um, um, systems in place, even the school, have, uh, even the, the safer neighborhood police have to think about what they can and can't say because you've got to balance of all people's rights. 
I think that the work that we do with the schools have drilled down to doing some dedicated exploitation, missing training and education as part of the core part uh, 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 curriculum uh, offered to teachers and governors. Um, and we have workshops with parents. Uh, we've just launched a campaign in our own local authority, really making, bringing alive to parents some of the risks that they were oblivious to. If Johnny says, I'm going next door to stay with Bev, they take it on trust and then I don't really that piece of work that um, parents would normally undertake it seems to have slipped a little then we so we work with the parents the governors the teachers uh, and the uh, each of our schools have a representation on our safeguarding partnerships so they can inform commissioning and strategic direction but they're involved in the layers underneath as well so our experience is that there isn't a disconnect with the schools what i think is complicated is the school economy the school structures us of, of us academies free schools faith schools <laughs> and finding a uh, somebody who's truly representative to champion and lead 70 schools in any local authorities is a challenge. Where do we get that consistency? We need consistency across the board, don't we, with this? This is vital. What could we be recommending to make sure that that happens? I think that the, it is a challenge, and I think that my Directors of Children's Services, uh, I'm here representing one, <laughs> um, would take the challenge. It is, it's going to be a role for all the uh, London DCSs to think about how the education sphere, the, the, spe the sector, can come together to look at the governance arrangements, first of all, what we want them to represent, and then what are, are they really connected at the hard end in a very challenging and busy job to work with the Save the Neighbourhood Police to, sh to share that softer intelligence often is what helps. And I think that we need a a system someone suggested some years ago, eSense, that would sit on top of the police national database and help pull out information around children to be decimated. But that takes resource, it takes project development, it takes a lot, it, it, it takes two or three years to get that off the ground and funding. So the Commission might want to look at what systems would be available across uh, for information across the agencies that might ensure that our teachers just don't come and talk about their individual child or what's in their ward areas but can really contribute to the strategic development thank you thank you and to pick up on the point about the children who are uh, looked after children who are in, uh, outside of their own boroughs and that what i was really concerned about and perhaps um uh, the uh, MOPAC and MET uh, could answer, help me with this. We, you've raised all the concerns, the worries, you, you've, and, the, and the problems, but have you been able to use your intelligence to pick up patterns that have helped you with your evidence to protect those children, those really vulnerable children who are in outer boroughs, out of their areas, and yet are still going missing? Well, maybe, I mean, maybe I'll just kick off by talking about a particular section of those, so those that are engaged with county lines. Um, so the strategic assessment on our county lines rescue service that we publish every year has seen the number of referrals from constabularies outside of London, so not the Met, but other county polices go up and up and up. It's so about 70 last year, so, oh, sorry, beg your pardon, way more than that. Um, so 40% of referrals are now coming from outside. So young people, who, young people who are involved in county lines operation but are London children are now being rescued by rescue and response and brought back to London and safeguarded. So I think the situation is remarkably improving. Um, Kevin, I, I think there are probably wider points maybe you want to draw on, but uh, certainly. And I think there's a lot more we can do from the Met perspective, you know, working with our colleagues in Operachi and elsewhere to make sure we build on that referrals from within the Met as well. You know, Will's rightly talking about an increase in referrals from outside can establish we can probably do more in that space in the Met. I think we welcome the challenge of working on that together to increase those internal referrals, whilst at the same time, um, broader issues around placements, as colleagues rightly alluded to, we have the multi-agency uh, criminal exploitation um, forums and at the same time some boroughs, I know certainly the one I would police last myself, have gangs multi-agency panels where we do try to track you know, what is happening to at-risk gang members as they move across different force boundaries or, or indeed within the force and where we think we might be potentially at risk of moving them towards conflict. We have obviously that multi-agency forum to address that very point with local authority, with diversionary pathway colleagues so that we can try to make sure we do avoid those pitfalls. So yes, I don't mean to sound like we're just polishing the problem and doing nothing about it. There is synergy around this. I think as with all such things, the demands 
as I alluded to before, of the limitations of where placements are will always be an inevitable driver because there's only so many placements to go around and children may need to be moved. That's something that I need to work more closely with the, the, the ADCS is about, you know, in terms of making sure that, that we have the best possible coordination between us of where young people are moved when they're moved out of their own local authority area. That will be a work in progress for some time to come um, as just the makeup of London continues to ebb and flow as it always does. Thank you. I'm going to move on to um, some specific areas that anyone from the panel can answer. Does the 2014 statutory guidance on children who go missing from home or care go far enough to represent the risks and links between missing children and gang and sexual exploitation? I'm happy for anyone to pick that one up. According to Josh McAllister, no. no. <laughs> Sorry? The, the, the National no. Child Care Review... Yeah. made some helpful findings in that area and suggested that there was more work to be done. Mm. Um, and for the first time, recognised that this wasn't a locality issue, it was a national problem. It was a mm. national uh, uh, issue for us to address. So in our experience um, it, as practice leads, we will have our resident children found from rescue and response in Scotland. But the laws, rules, police force operations are completely different um, to the way that we work with the Met. Uh, and so I think that the suggestion from the child care, the National Child Care Review are ones that we must take seriously. Mm. I agree with that. Um, yeah. I'm aware that the Department for Education is revising that guidance and um, we're partly waiting for that review before doing it. Um, but they certainly are aware that the, the guidance is not up to date in, in terms of the understanding we now have around different forms of exploitation as well so i believe that will be reviewed thank you um we're moving on to the mayor's priorities now and and he's he's made made some very bold statements when it comes to missing children um his aspiration is of zero children going missing that's very bold considering everything you have just said about the complexities of missing children the fact that a child can go missing just to I know, from my experience, I know from the teacher, just to annoy their parents to the extreme end, which is incredibly frightening. What, what do you think of that statement in terms of uh, his aspiration? Do you think um, there is any explicit action that MOPAC is doing to make that possible? And maybe there should be a, a, a different way of defining what missing children is to really meet those targets. So I think um, my understanding is that the mayor has actually committed to mission zero. I, 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 I understood that was a motion filed by Assembly Member Bailey um, that, that, that everyone agreed to. I think what the mayor has said is there are too many missing children and one missing child is too much. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not. I, I, I think that probably is a. Uh, I think that probably is a good statement. So I mean, you, you, you then ask a really good question, which is, well, what are we doing about it? Um, you know, whether, whether it's zero or whether it's just, you know, a lot less. Um, so I think we've already talked about some of the commissioned services that we have in London. Um, admittedly, most of the ones that MOPAC, uh, MOPAC commissions that we've, that we've heard about are for children who are already victims. Um, so we are mostly trying to prevent re-victimisation and Sherry characterised that really well. Fortunately, um, or, 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 although as our, our panel member was saying, you know, there's been a disinvestment in prevention services across the country, City Hall's really bucking the trend there. So the Violence Reduction Unit, which is an ever-growing programme, is one of the biggest preventative programmes uh, of, of its kind. And it's in schools with the whole school approach, which is fantastic. And I think next time you have Violence Reduction Unit colleagues here, I, I think it'd be really great to hear some of the incredible progress they're making with, mm. with schools, which is fantastic. We're also doing a lot with statutory partners, so fantastic to, 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 to have Beverly here. From uh, uh, We work really closely with the Association of London Directors of Children's Services. Uh, we also, I sit uh, and MOPAC funds, uh, the Mayor funds, uh, the uh, Safeguarding Executive, which has just gone under new chairmanship. Fantastically, it's the Chief Executive of Bromley now, who's an ex Director of Children's Services himself. Uh, and we contribute to, among other things, uh, lots of the procedures work they've been doing. There's a real drive in London, which is fantastic for children's services to start working together a bit more. And there's something called uh, uh, the London Improvement Alliance, which my former colleague Ben Byrne uh, uh, works on, which is a fantastic thing. Uh, so there's loads. There's loads, isn't there? But are we going to get to zero? I, I, I don't think we'll ever get to zero, no, unless 
you know. So let, shall, we, shall we be explicit on that and actually be really honest about it? Because I think it's really unfair. Yeah. It's really unfair on people who are going missing every day, who've been impacted by it, the victims, the families, yeah. to say you're going to do zero and not do it. And yeah, it, I, I, know, I don't think let's, the mayor's pledged, pledged, to, pledged to zero. And the police and crime plan doesn't say zero either. So um, I, I, I'm not sure. Sorry, apologies. I, I, I don't know where that's sort of coming from. Assembly member, just can she just come in for a uh, minute? I, I do think that the, the, you know, we as an assembly we agreed that it was important that we work to have zero missing children, and that is mm. that is what this is about. It's about, and we've heard from people all morning who are doing everything they can to reduce the number of children who go missing. Um, yeah, so I completely I, agree I, with I, that. I, I think I, you know, I think we're all agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely agree with that. I just think we need to have a definition on missing children and what that means, and, yeah. and I think can, that's what what we need to be clear on. Can I can I ask you, Assembly Member, to keep your eye on the screen because I think. Um, I I'm very happy for uh, yeah, Sherry to come and Sherry, yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I, my points were really around some... First of all, I endorse the fact that we should all be aspiring that no child goes missing at Safer London. We would absolutely endorse that, although I realise we've got a very long road to travel. Um, but secondly, one of the things that I wanted to talk about when we were talking about schools and the challenges for schools and then out of borough placements is that actually safeguarding online now is such a huge issue. It's a huge issue for schools that many incidents happen outside of school, but the school are having to take on that responsibility because it's coming back into schools, whether or not schools have got the additional resources to do that. And when children are placed out of, out of county or out of borough, really they're all still very much connected online. So we really mustn't, forget the fact that for children, online safety and the risks that are posed to them is really critical. And I don't think we've mentioned that today. So it's worth just storing it there and, and I'll be quiet there because it was about the other questions rather than this one. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm just gonna move on now to another question uh, for Will. You're my favourite person today. Um, in what ways is the uh, Mayor's police and crime plan specifically helping to improve London's response to missing children? And how is the Mayor and MOPAP working with the Violence Reduction Unit and partner organisation to prevent children going missing? Now, you may have mentioned something already, or, but is there anything more you want to add? I, I mean, just, 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 just for time, yeah, hopefully, I mean, hopefully I've given a good categorisation, uh, a good flavour. Uh, uh, of everything we do, but it's, it's you know it's it's really important for the mayor, and I think we've got a whole section in the police and crime plan, um, making it clear that protecting people from exploitation harm is 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 is, is a huge part of it. Um, the deputy mayor also specifically on some of the Met things chairs a, a specific oversight group around child protection improvement, which has already led to and seen some improvement. That group's connected to the safeguarding executive, which I mentioned earlier, which is which is fantastic. Really close partnership working the VRU. I mean, they're very much in the prevention space and the schools approach. And I, th I think we've talked about that. I mean, something we haven't talked about is actually the work we did last year on the launching the looked uh, cr deep, uh, criminalization of looked after children protocol, or rather reducing criminalization of looked after children protocol. Brilliant joint work it includes uh, 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 Philomena, uh, we, work with, we work with every local authority. Uh, what's really important about that is sometimes reporting of these missing instances when children aren't missing, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're just being reported by their placement, actually can sort of criminalise the child, you know, because mm. the police are involved now. Uh, and it also breaks down the trust between the carer. Uh, social care colleagues will tell you way more about this, but it's something that comes up a lot in return home interviews. So actually that reducing criminalisation of looked after children protocol is actually one of the things I think the Deputy Mayor uh, uh, personally, these are some things I'm most proud of, actually, in the, in the, in the, that we've done at MOPAC. Thank you so much, Will, for um, all of your answers. Now, I'm going to just ask a general question, a last question from me. What additional specific steps can the Mayor and the Met take to protect and prevent children and young people going missing in London? So anything that you think um, has not been mentioned by Will, it would be great to hear from you. Thank you, Susanna. Um, so at Missing People, we work in partnership with every police force around the country. Um, and one of the ways that we do that is we offer some free to access services that the police can use to help them find and safeguard missing children. 
So um, we offer good links into our family support team so that we can provide support to a family, make sure that they're able to work effectively with the police to find their missing child. We um, offer a tech safe service so um, when a child is missing, the a police officer will request it, but we from missing people will send them a text message saying we're here, we're independent, we can offer you confidential support because often children are not ready to be back in touch with the family, not ready to reach out to the police, but will reach out to a third sector agency. Um, and also we can offer publicity appeals, both public appeals, which you might have seen around the place in terms of billboards, social media, print media, but also if that uh, public appeal might make a, a child more vulnerable, and we know in many cases it does. We will offer instead a, a behind the scenes um, appeal through professionals who are the sort of eyes and ears of their community, perhaps train station managers, community health services, and so on. So the Met are good users of those services, but it could be better. Um, so currently around 10% of children who are missing in London get a tech safe message. And we would love that to be a higher percentage because that's a really easy way of offering that safeguarding response to the child at the moment when they're in crisis. Thank you, that's an excellent idea. And anyone else? I mean, just a couple of points. One's not specifically for the for the Meta Mopac, um, but it does relate back to schools and actually is relatively resource free. I think um, clearly it's something where we need to consider consent and information sharing. But I know that there are local authorities around the country where. When a child is reported missing, the school is automatically informed. So the school is aware and can kind of then begin to explore um, in, in a safe weather, a space where the child already feels safe and comfortable, uh, some of the things that might be going on and offer support. Because sometimes a child will go missing and actually nobody apart from the immediate family might know that that's happened. Um, so I think that's just something that, that's worth considering. I think there are two things that I um, might just like to mention really, really briefly. One is around, and I understand what a huge, a hugely complicated um, thing this is, but just ensuring that the training for um, Met Police officers is really comprehensive so that they understand. We've already actually had a little bit of a conversation about missing and what is the definition of missing, you know, because a lot of the stuff in statutory guidance is actually open to interpretation. What does independent of the care of the child actually mean? Um, and we know that different people interpret it in different ways. When does 72 hours start? Um, so I think it's just being really clear about what is in statutory guidance, being really understanding when a child is missing and that um, the National Police lead would very much advocate that we never take um, a kind of tick box approach to uh, assessing uh, missing risk. We look always at the child and their specific circumstances and vulnerabilities. Um, and uh, that includes being trauma informed, really deeply understanding trauma, not having um, a 40 minute training session once every five years, but really understanding what that looks like. Back to uh, unaccompanied asylum, uh, asylum seeking children, looking at culturally competent support. And that's not just linguistic support, because actually some, there are some cultures in which words like rape and exploitation um, don't exist. So we need to, so actually there's conceptual kind of gaps there that need to be filled in. I think that that's really important. And finally, just to mention again, mental health. We know how many children are going missing due to their mental health. If we can begin to really sort out uh, early access to mental health support, then I think that could also help to decrease the numbers. It would be remiss that my colleagues would have much to say to me when I return to the office if I didn't mention that listening to children and building on the points that have been made is critical for all agencies. It's every mm. professional's responsibility to be skilled up in listening, hearing and acting on some of the very sensitive things that our children tell us. Um, and um, I, I think that there's got to be better collaboration and partnership working in joint training endeavours, joint learning and education endeavours. And one a practical example for us as practice leads would be um, sharing the return, the analysis of the return home interviews. So if we really want to get to zero missing, we've got to listen to the reasons why children go missing and the return home interviews is a missed opportunity if we don't have some analytical ability to dissect what, that's, what that says across London. Absolutely. Can I just add one final 
point really and it's about utilizing information from those children that are missing from education that for many years now we've talked about um, trying to link that into the wider missing data and some work around that and um, working with schools closer for those children that are regularly going missing could be really useful. Thank you, Chair. Susanna has got one more point, but it's up to you if you're... Concerned. Yes, if it's brief. Thank you, Susanna. I hope it's brief. It's just on the point of the zero missing children aspiration, which I would support because we all know if we can prevent, as, as Will's been saying, children getting to a crisis point through better early intervention, better support, they're less likely to go missing. But just a couple of notes of caution that sometimes going missing is the right response from a child because they're in danger in the situation they're in and going missing can actually make them safer. So just um, wanting there to be space for those children to still have a response. And I guess there's all always a danger with a target that it creates unintended consequences so if if that's set as a target to the met could that mean officers feel less likely to actually record a child as missing because they've got this target to reduce the numbers and that could mean people slipping through the safeguarding net so i'm not saying it's it's not a good idea but i think there's just a couple of notes of caution to to if that is something that the mayor wants to take on to liaise with the Met on how that could happen effectively because as Kevin said it's really important for the Met to know when there is a child missing and at risk and be able to respond. Uh, Commander we're, co we're coming back to your section if you want to uh, quickly answer that. I, I think I know that the, the panel we all understand it's an aspiration it should not be a well, it shouldn't be a realistic target. It's never going to be a realistic target. Certainly, Chair, and I'll try not to delay the panel. I know you need to move quickly. I was just mindful that that last question was framed around what can the police do differently in this space. So I wanted to perhaps just add a bit of reassurance, if I may, around some of the training that we've been doing. Um, and I will whistle stop it to yes, save time. Yes, because the next section is actually the Met's response to missing children. Shall I whole fire then? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And if, it did, if, if we don't cover that, I'm very happy for it to come in at the end of this section. Thank you. So we will move on to the next response to missing children. That's being taken by my colleague, Assemblymember Devonish. Uh, thank you, Chair. As, as you said, the title is The Met's Response to Missing Children. So if I start with Susanna and then move on to Sherry and Sarah and then Beverly, uh, my first question is, in your experience, how do the people you work with, both professionals and families view the Met's response to missing children? What are the main challenges identified and where is there room for improvement, please? Susanna. Sure, thank you for the um, question. And I think what we need to recognise is the Met's challenge around responding to missing children is, is perhaps harder than any other force because of the scale, because of the number of partners that they have to liaise with thinking in terms of local authorities, you, you know, you know all of this stuff, but just wanted to, to recognise it's, it's a really tough response. And I think one of the things that um, families tell us, which links to one of the questions around um, the HMIC FRS child protection inspection, is that um, sometimes they feel that not much is done to find the missing person in those first 48 hours. So some of that I think is perhaps partly a communication issue from the Met because um, cases will go into the missing persons unit after 48 hours. But when that's communicated to families, it sounds as if nothing is happening before that, which we know isn't the case. Um, but I'd be really interested to know what's happened at the Met since that inspection, which found that um, quite often there were very limited actions taking place unless someone was recorded as high risk in those first 48 hours. So I know that inspection finding is a few years old, so, um, but it is something that comes up for families, I think, that they're, you know, they're, they, they also find that there can be frustrations in not being kept up to date with information. So they're obviously racked with worry and concern about a missing loved one. And sometimes it can be really challenging to find out what's happening from the police. And again, recognizing that police colleagues are really busy, but sometimes that family member might have new information that they can't pass on or just need an update and reassurance, even if there's no update to give, but just to know that there, there is still a focus on finding that missing child. Um, 
I, I think I endorse all of that. I, I think it would be remiss of me to sit here and um, not note that for many people within London, the fact that parts of the Metropolitan Police have issues around misogyny and racism will impact on communities' engagement with the police at all sorts of times. That said, um, even though professional networks are under immense strain, information sharing when children go missing usually works quite well. Um, that, of course, is only within that professional network, um, but strategy meetings are, are called quite regularly. Police engagement sometimes is patchy within those um, meetings, but I've experienced lots of really positive police action, um, you know, really going above and beyond when children are regularly missing, but also reluctance to get involved on some occasions when children perhaps are those children that regularly go missing. Um, there can sometimes be a reluctance to get involved. There are some basic problems too, and nothing that anybody else wouldn't have mentioned. So the simple act of contacting the police officer that you're trying to work with due to shift patterns and sometimes lack of mobile phone numbers can be an issue. There's a reduced number of, of officers and they are desperately overstretched and picking up things that perhaps 20 years ago, police officers wouldn't be expected to be working around. So when Kevin and I met the other day, we were talking about um, some of the programs out in the US where um, the police are being supported by services that work particularly around mental health that would go out and work with people that have got mental health issues rather than the police go out. Um, we spoke today about working across borders and the complex police structures that actually if somebody is a perpetrator of violence but also a victim of exploitation, which part of the police team in that BCU would we be wanting to work with? Um, and finally, the turnover of young, inexperienced officers. And, you know, I, we have that same problem. I think everybody's having that same problem of recruitment. Um, so a bit of a mixed bag for us, really. Um, but a willingness to listen from senior officers, without a doubt. Thank you. And Sarah? I absolutely echo um, what my colleagues have, have just said. Um, we, we did ask, so we asked, um, so speaking as co-chair of the ECRC, we did ask members um, whether they had seen improvement. And people did say that they had seen some improvement. They also said that they felt that there was room for more. Um, but I think everybody recognised that achieving consistency of practice across such a large and complex organisation is really difficult. Um, but I have a quote here from a missing worker from one London borough who said, I'm finding that each area of the Met works extremely different, differently. Some are very proactive, they consider exploitation risks, they liaise well with children's services. However, some areas do not really communicate with children's services at all and take little action to locate the missing child. I think that just demonstrates that actually we talk about the Met as though it's one thing. It, it isn't. It's actually an enormous collection of teams who work actually sometimes in quite different and, and diverse ways. Um, in terms of some of the issues, um, parents talk about the difficulty of actually getting through. <laughs> so actually just the amount of time you might hang on a telephone line in order to get through to report a child missing. And then some of the difficulties of reporting children missing. We think that's improved. That's something that we've raised before. We have worked with um, police colleagues on, and we think that that has improved. Um, and clearly, you know, we, we do, uh, we've already talked about the Howard League report about the criminalisation of children care. We certainly don't want children in care to have um, any more contact with the police than any other child would have. Um, but there have been cases where we believe a child has clearly met the definition of missing, but the police still would not accept the report. And that comes from us in Catch-22 in our services, but other colleagues across London as well. Um, a service manager of one borough told us, we're still experiencing police not accepting frequently missing children as missing any longer. So they might have accepted the first few, but then after a while, they're no longer accepting them as missing. I think they're regarding it as behavior. Um, they're regarding it then as an annoyance. Um, this is often when the police have not really looked at indicators of exploitation. So I think, again, the, my colleague from this London borough was talking about the fact that the, she felt that the police who were dealing with that perhaps didn't really understand the nature of exploitation and grooming. And whilst it may look like, um, uh, I don't know, delinquent behaviour, actually, this is a child who is, who is being exploited. 
Um, and then one London borough raised was the issue of missing versus wanted. We understand that if a young person is considered wanted by the police, even for low-level issues such as historic breach of a tag or something, then they will be considered as wanted foremost and closed then to the missing units because that would be a duplication of resources. The worry we have and what we wanted to raise or query is what impact this might have for the young person and the resources used to locate somebody who is clearly vulnerable, particularly if police have more pressing or priority wanted cases where other people might be deemed a risk to the public. So th that, that thing where we're not entirely sure how to respond to a child when they're being criminally exploited, it's the victim-perpetrator thing again. You know, if, if we're actually regarding them more as a perpetrator and they're wanted, then actually they may be vulnerable, but they're not receiving the missing response. And if they're not reported missing, they don't get then any of the support from services such as the ones that MOPAC commissions. Um, so that's an issue which uh, has been raised by one particular borough. Thank you. Beverly? I think from the practice leader's perspective, we must um, work harder to ensure that we're moving away from any approach that adultifies children. Um, and I think that we see that often in the way that, in the response to unaccompanied asylum seekers. Um, and I think that there is a, a, a will or a, a, in the strategic levels to change that. Uh, and we're really delighted to see it. But uh, it's the person who answers the phone to that social worker who is calling to convene a strat where we need to target some resources uh, and, it, uh, and some of our time. Uh, I also think that I endorse what has been said, but the other area for me will, would be around how we treat and understand how very vulnerable children with special educational needs and SEMHE needs are to exploitation and to be coerced into being missing. Um, and then in the spectrum of missing, I'm going to go and see my family that you, you social care say I can't. <laughs> Um, to actually criminal exploitation, our data tells us that children with special educational needs and at the certain part of the world are the most vulnerable, but yet um, in terms of the work that we do across the sector, including the police, education, social care and health, we can't leave them out of the agenda, they need to be brought into this discussion, um, are least equipped to help us understand the f um, some of the impact of them going missing because of their disability or special needs. Thank you. And back to you, Commander. Uh, in what circumstances does the Met refuse a report of a missing child and how often does this happen, please? This concept of reviews and a report of a missing child, I think I need to look into more closely, perhaps with, with partners offline, uh, Assemblymember Devonish, in that I'm not aware of that being a practice of ours. If we have a child reported to us as missing, we will report them as missing. So we comply with the authorised professional practice of the, of the National Police Chiefs Council in that, for instance, the term absence, you know, an absence, which used to be a term used a couple of years ago in missing, has now been, now been abandoned. So we don't treat a child who is simply absent from care as being anything other than a missing child. I think there is always a balance in such things and on a case-by-case -case basis and one of the benefits of their course is to, is to work and listen with partners who, who have a sort of a really insight into these areas is that each individual case won't be on its merits. So where we have a repeatedly missing young person coming from say a care home setting where we know that it's testing the boundaries of that setting turning up a couple of minutes after the hour in each instance we need to be really careful with that that we don't over-police in this space, especially as we recognise that so many of these young people are coming from communities that may feel quite disengaged from the Met, maybe diverse communities, quite often, as we said before, the young black community. So we don't want their experience of the police to be, every time they turn up two minutes late from the curfew, they're being hunted by the police. So we really need to be cautious, striking this balance between not adultifying and not over-policing the community, whilst at the same time making sure the community is safe is one of the sort of the wicked problems that our frontline inspectors and the resource and demand teams who manage those missing persons in the first instance really have to balance carefully because I'm sure many of the young people who do find themselves in difficult situations, some of whom, as Susanna rightly said, may be almost better off missing if they're in a dangerous setting in the first instance. We need to take a really careful approach from a policing perspective that we come at that from a compassionate and supportive point of view working with our partners rather than us screaming around their own blue lights as if we're hunting them down in an arrest inquiry. Um, may I take this opportunity, uh, Assembly Member, to address some of the other points that were raised? I was making some notes because some really sure. key points in there, if I may. Um, Chair, if you'll indulge me. So really positively endorse everything everyone said and, and super keen to work with colleagues, you know, some of whom I'm meeting for the first time today, some of whom I've, I've worked with extensively already. Um, I met with the practice leaders, Beverly, just the other day, actually, en masse. Um, I can't remember whether you were there or not. Forgive me. 
you were, apologies, right? There was quite a few of you. And uh, we actually discussed the issue, didn't we, of wanted missing it, and, um, and, and um, I hope you'll be pleased to hear subsequently since that. I had a public protection delivery board just last week with every single public protection lead for the city, so all the detective superintendents, where we discussed the, exactly that point, and we radiated the message loud and clear, as I said earlier, in relation to um, children and young people with insecure immigration status. The child-first approach will always involve us putting the missing situation first if we believe that child is at risk. So it is making sure we have that strap meeting, making sure we engage with partners to bring them back to a place of safety. Whether they then have insecure immigration status, whether they're wanted for a crime, is always going to be secondary. Now within that, never say never, never say always. If we have a child, Sherry and I were talking the other day about a, a case she was cited on where a young lady was simultaneously victim and suspect. Simultaneously someone guilty of, undoubtedly guilty of very serious crimes, including, including stabbings and so on and so forth, whilst at the same time a victim of serious sexual violence herself. You know, these are the challenges that we face in modern society. And within that instance, there might be a case of if the crime is so serious, we may well have to expedite the wanted missing part of that because there is a victim to that who requires justice also. So you can see just how vexed some of these issues are. But our fundamental position, as relayed to all of my peers and, and public protection leads just the other day, following my meeting with the practice leaders, is that we will always put the child first approach in place and a strap meeting should be taking place. And even if that's after the event of an arrest, and we'll try and make sure that we do exactly that. Um, just moving across some of the other points, the point about um, initial inquiries, we have the resource and demand teams who lead on this um, for us, and that's all missing persons, low, medium and high. I should just reassure everyone, hopefully, especially my partners on the panel, but the wider community listening, that where you have a high-risk missing person, that is almost treated as a, not quite a critical incident, perhaps, but as a very serious incident in every measure. So as an on-call commander for London, as I was just recently for four days, I'm notified personally of all the high-risk missing persons, young and old, that have been dealt with around the city and what activities were taken to actually find them. So consider that's a chief officer oversight through the Met Grip chief inspector in our call room, working with the local BCU and, and the resource and demand team to make sure the risk assessment is right, make sure that necessary inquiries are underway. And I, I hope and, and believe that the strong work of my colleagues, many of whom are very busy, as rightly alluded to by Susanna, is one of the reasons why, thankfully, we haven't had a fatality of a young misper in quite some time, and why we do see so many recovered in, in less than 48 hours. So not by any means throwing up the bunting and suggesting everything is, is, is rosy, because there's so much more we need to do. And partners here have mentioned some of those points today. But the training that we're rolling out now across all aspects of missing persons, I hope, again, will give this panel some reassurance and likewise the Assembly, in that we have devised, I think, the nation's first missing persons investigation course, a two-day course, which has been rolled out to all of our missing persons units. We're extending that to those resource and demand teams to assist with that first-line response to those immediate MISPERS, even if they're low risk. We have our Operation Aegis capability, which rolls around all the BCUs of the city, trying to train the emergency response team officers, who will often be that first port of call for referrals of young MISPers uh, into the service, to make sure that they understand that the voice of the child, which is a really key phraseology, which all of my partners on the panel will be aware of, is paramount in our thoughts. We have to be able to hear and understand the voice of the child, in addition to understanding the prevailing contextual safeguarding issues, the, the other factors that I alluded to earlier that may potentially be in play. Why is that child who seems to be of no means coming home with a really fancy pair of trainers that may cost £150, where are they getting that money? Is it a sign of grooming for sexual exploitation, grooming for criminal exploitation? Is it a sign that they themselves are involved in street robbery? We need to consider all these facets. We have the highest ever turnover of officers that we've ever known in all of my 25 years of service. It's my 25th anniversary today, actually. And, um, and I have to say, I'm massively impressed by the work that they do for us and the commitment they show. <coughs> the challenge for myself as Commander for Public Protection is ensuring that training reaches right through to the PCs at the front line and police staff members in MetCC, reaches right through in a more invested way in those missing persons teams who are responsible for those high-risk missing person inquiries. And as you'll probably know, and certain Beverly will know, we recently did some training with local authorities around return home interviews, some joint training. So again, how we work with our partners to understand the value of debriefing these young people when they return. So we'll, even after the event, we can identify what's driven them diagnostically to go missing and then try and prevent that in the future going forward. And all of that is before we get to the point of the missing persons coordinators, one for each BCU, who actually link in as alluded to earlier, with the uh, multi-agency partners that we have in this space, to try to look at that hardcore cohort that you alluded to, Chair, who go missing all too frequently to see if we can bring down the overall incidences and try to prevent them from coming to harm. 
Um, I suppose I should emphasise perhaps just some of the points we went to earlier as well in terms of the scale and complexity. Really grateful for Susanna emphasising that on our behalf. We talked about grooming for sexual exploitation and Assemblymember Garrett asked before about how good we are at identifying adults who may be preying on children in that space. You know, National Crime Agency colleagues, you know, estimate in, in a recent report that there's over three quarters of a million adults in this country who have some sort of sexual interest in children. You know, that's the scale of the challenge that we face, as daunting as that is. Now, much of that will be online, it will be non-contact, but that's a real concern for me, both as a professional and as a parent, and for all of us, I'm sure. How we get ahead of that in terms of our online investigations to identify that surreptitious grooming in the cyberspace, the online space that we may not see, may not be evident to us or to our partners. That's a real challenge for us as well. Um, so how we invest in digital investigation in the online space, online violence against women and girls, is another new front, really, in our bid to try and tackle all forms of vulnerability, exploitation, though, and missing in particular. Thank you, Commander. And without repeating yourself, uh, in what ways has the Met improved its response to the children reporting missing over the past five years, please? I, I fear I may be guilty of repeating myself there, so I, I shall... I shall try and bullet point the things I've said rather than repeat them. So Philomena was a huge protocol to be implemented, and as colleagues have said, I think it's been largely successful. It's, it's pleasing to hear that it's been reflected by my peers here and likewise in societies. Um, the training that I've just alluded to, the multi-tiered training that we've invested, the investment in missing persons units in each BCU, there have been one or two pilots which we're really interested in. I visited Bethnal Green Police Station the other day where they were talking me through a merger that they've effective of their exploitation team and the missing persons team so that they could better tease out those risks of things like county lines grooming. So there's some interesting pilots in place. There's some interesting technological developments that we're looking at such as GoodSAM, which is this ability to potentially, a bit like TechSafe, but to do almost a video interview, if you like, with young people using new technology who may be missing, not quite ready to come back to us yet, but at least willing to show us where they are because, of course, there are risks in, in text message contact only. Um, so lots being done, and lots will continue to be done in that space. I think, going back to the point I made right at the beginning of, this, of the uh, session today, I hope you'll forgive me, the work that we'll be doing next with Evidence and Insight at MOPAC, and, and that we stand shoulder to shoulder in this, MOPAC, police and partners alike, how we better understand the scale, the diagnostics, the drivers, improve our data sets, and then take those big steps forward that we need. That's the only way we'll really get traction against this. And then it would be lovely to reach that noble aspiration of zero missing children. But we must be careful we don't over-police our way to that. Thank you. And uh, moving on to MOPAC and Will, is the mayor satisfied with the progress made by the Met? Uh, and what else would the mayor like to see done? Um, well, I mean, I can't, I can't speak entirely for the mayor, but what I, what I can say is that uh, we, we, we always want the Met to carry on improving. You know, whilst in, in the, the deputy mayor chairs the specific oversight that I mentioned earlier for child protection, um, and we are not disbanding that, despite the, uh, despite the 21 uh, report saying that the Met had made significant improvement. We're, we're, we're not disbanding that. Similarly, um, the Peel report uh, recently published, you know, also makes a number of uh, a number of recommendations. Again, we stand shoulder to shoulder and try to improve these things, but you know, it'll never be good enough. Uh, uh, Tony, I think is I think is the true answer. And uh, sorry, Assembly Member Devadish, um, and 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 Kevin's ambitions, personal ambitions in this area, I know are incredibly high too. Um, so I, I I don't think it'll ever be enough. Okay, if you've got anything else, you can you can write to us. I'm always interested what the mayor and MOPAC are doing. Back to the commander, um, what action is the Met taking to ensure investigative response matches the le identified level of risk and history of the child? And again, without repeating yourself, please. Sorry, Assembly Member, do you mind just repeating yeah. that for me? What action is the Met taking to ensure its investigative response matches the identified level of risk and the history of the child, please. Mm. It will come down to the grading, uh, and that's something that is, is, is regulated in some ways out with our control. So for instance, uh, if we want to do advanced uh, telecommunications inquiries around a high risk missing person, we need to be able to justify to the, the IPCO, to the Investigatory Powers Commissioners, that we are doing something which is genuinely to tackle a life at risk. So we're actually bound by legislation to make sure that we don't overuse disproportionately some powers in seeking to track and trace, if I can use that phrase, young people who might be missing using quite advanced techniques that we might only normally use for quite serious criminality. 
and only using those sparingly in situations where we genuinely believe a life is at risk. So an evidence there, I hope, of how we are both willingly but also by, by statute compelled to be proportionate in our approach to missing people in, in keeping with the risk. I hope that's helpful. Is that where you're going with that? That's absolutely. Thank you. Uh, and what checks and controls has the Met put in place to ensure that it treats all reports of missing children fairly? Mm. So we have a, a dedicated inspection team which is, sits under the same uh, leadership uh, myself as oversight as Operation Aegis. So our training capability in this space walks hand in glove with our inspection capability. And every um, sort of eight or nine months we do a dedicated inspection of missing persons to look at the, both the categorization and then the commensurate action that follows every missing person clearly with the volumes that we have 70 a day it won't do them all during that period but it's a dip sample across BCUs uh, and then we'll bring what is almost 100 cases back to the London Child Protection Improvement Oversight Panel so the Deputy Mayor and the Assistant Commissioner for Frontline Policing can actually hear those findings Interestingly, the next DIT report on MISPA is actually finalised now as we speak. It's presenting to me at the next Public Protection Delivery Board. It'll be presenting at the next iteration of the LCP IOP, although I know Will's teams and I are working together to perhaps reformat that slightly. So we have a level of governance and inspection internally, which then reports externally to MOPAC as well and comes round on a regular cadence to give us hopefully that reassurance. Thank you. And is the Met now using trigger plans to effectively inform investigations? In, trigger plans with care homes and, and so on? Yes, yes, absolutely. Part of the Philomena Protocol, sir. Okay, thank you. Um, and then moving back to the rest of the, the rest of the panel, give the commander a rest. Uh, back to Susanna, uh, Sherry, Sarah and Beverly. Um, do you agree with the HMIC uh, that the Met may be missing quote, early opportunities to quickly find a child and make sure they are safe, unquote. Susanna. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, this is something that families raise with us, that they sometimes um, feel they don't know what is happening, particularly in those first 48 hours. I know Kevin's mentioned the new RAD teams, I think they're called. Um, who are meant to be looking at that, but I think it, it, is, it will be interesting to see the impact of those in terms of how investigations are perhaps more, um, feel less tick boxy in those first 48 hours as HMIC found out. And, and so it'd be interesting to see if there's a, a way of looking at that. Um, and we'll certainly be keeping an eye on that for, for families as well. And one, of, one point that I just wanted to raise is Obviously, data and statistics can tell you lots of different stories, but there is um, there is something in, in NCA data which has data from every force that fewer missing children are found by the police in London than the national average. Now, I don't know the reasons behind that, but I think it's certainly something to keep an eye on. Why is that? Why, why are more um, either being found by other professionals, parents and carers, or um, other, you know, coming back by themselves. And that may be a good thing because we've all talked about the criminalization of children not wanting too much police contact, but I think that is definitely something to understand further. Thank you. Sherry? Um, first thing, I just wanted to qualify. I've been, in the five years that I've been Chief Exec at Safer London, we've never had the Metropolitan Police re refuse a missing um, report. I don't know about other people's experience, but we've always been able to lodge them. I think that on occasions, endorsing everything that Susanna just said, some of the early opportunities are missed. Um, sometimes that can be for a variety of reasons, including families' reluctance to report immediately because of that perhaps perception of what the police involvement may lead to. Sometimes it's about the lack of police response um, and other times the response is really positive. So I think it's a bit of a, a, a mixed bag. But again, I'd like to remind you that we work with children and young people at that real complex end. So I can't speak about, you know, the child that's gone missing for the very first time after not coming home from school. They may get a very different response. We're working with children that are um, usually well known to the police or other statutory services. Thank you. And Sarah and Beverly, only if you've got anything you, to add. Um, I think that there is a huge opportunity for us 
to really um, work closer with the Met around this intergenerational community engagement piece. There are particular communities, if our children from the Tottenham Academy had, an, had a voice, they would say what happens in this house stays in this house is the mantra across many families. Um, and so it, there, there, there is a, a real desperate need from the practice leaders' perspective for us to continue the work that we're doing to engage those communities. They're not hard to reach, they're not hard to identify. There are just some stubborn intergenerational beliefs and, and thinking that um, cascade down to their children so they won't share information uh, and we've got to do something about that. I think the second thing for me is really a, to do with picking up the point around where, who finds children. Uh, if we triangulate some of the data that we have, uh, at the incidences of local authorities going to the family courts to get recovery orders, we're seeing an increase in the reliance on that, particularly for looked after children. And, it, and again, I think this is an opportunity for us to throw that into the data uh, and intelligence discussions to see why that's happening. Thank you. And Commander, your final word to you on this section. How is the EMET addressing this? And please be brief. Okay. Um, I alluded earlier to a, an enterprise approach to child safeguarding. Uh, Will and I have already sort of begun our conversations about this. I think for me, one of the challenges is to make sure that we look at our MASH processes, we look at the recommendations coming out of um, the tragic death of Star Hobson and Arthur Lavinia Hughes about the potential creation of multi-agency child protection units. We need to consider other LSCP exec partners and with other charities. We need to look at how we look at the child in the round for all of its risks. Um, we need to look at Operation Encompass in schools in terms of flagging up children who've witnessed domestic abuse at home. We need to look at every faculty of this right the way across to, as my colleagues alluded to before from Catch-22, children who are potentially at risk of self-harm because they've, as we saw with the tragic case of Molly Russell this week in the media, um, been, been sort of for, dragged down that road by algorithms online. The, the risks go on and on in every space, and the only pinch point for that for me is our sort of Kate Referrals Desk in a bolstered multi-agency safeguarding hub by definition multi-agency with access to the right levels of provision from all of our partners so that we can get ahead of the risks and prioritize the precious resources against those that need them most. Thank you, Commander. Chair? Um, I, I, I'll bring you in at the end. I've got a, a assembly member to sigh first. Thank you, Chair. Again, my question is to you, Commander. Uh, how do you work with uh, the British Transport, Pol uh, <coughs> the British Transport Police uh, in response to uh, missing children? with BTP? To be fair, Assemblymember Desai, I would have to come back to you in terms of our relationship with BTP, other than to say that obviously they're a very close partner of ours geographically, yeah. um, and we have the, the opportunity to, to reach into the officers and staff to help us try to locate people who might be missing on the transport network. I actually uh, spoke with uh, the Chief Constable, um, Lucy Dorsey, just the other day, actually, we talked about using their Oyster Card facilities more regularly than we currently do. Um, but in terms of the detailed granularity of what our teams do to link in at the COP <coughs> practitioner level, I'd have to write to you separately, I'm afraid. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Assemblymember Russell, did you still want to come <coughs> in at the back of this? You're fine, okay. Uh, Sarah, you want to, it, does it relate specifically to the Met? It, it does, yeah. <coughs> um, I was just going to say that, I, as I say, I've been collecting feedback from people. Somebody said how well trigger plans are being used in their area, and um, they thought that had really improved practice. Um, and I, I just wanted to make a point about language. I just think it's really important what language we use when we're talking about missing children. And I think one of the difficulties might be that, that, that the Met language is, uh, it's not the Met, actually, it's the police language, and actually, this isn't a Met issue. Um, but we talk about MISPAs, and that's very common kind of language. And that would be somebody who's 12 or somebody who's 72. They're a MISPA. I, I wonder if it's unhelpful to use that language. I wonder if when we're talking about a child, it helps to use different language so that we really identify the risks around that child. Um, and then just also, uh, uh, we're continuing to talk about the, the child again and what we can do for the child to keep themselves safe. Just wanted to make the point that the Met Police, I know, are really active, also looking at kind of places and spaces um, within the community. And it's important that the risks outside of the home are addressed, um, in addition to trying to focus on what can happen for that individual. Yes, thank you. I, th I, th I think that's come out loud and clear. And the problem with changing language is that we don't, other people don't keep up with it. And there's so many different terminologies for different things. 
Um, we can so easily say the wrong thing these days, especially as politicians. It's very difficult sometimes to keep up. Right, we've got one section left, and that's returning home and preventing future incidents. And that's going to be started by my uh, colleague, Dr. Sudhota. Uh, thank, you, <coughs> thank you, Chair. Um, this is a section about uh, uh, returning home and preventing future incidents. Uh, my first question is to the Met, please. Uh, how effective are police prevention interviews in preventing future missing children incidents? And what evidence is there to support what you're about to say to me? It's a very good question, uh, Assembly Member, in that I don't think we have that empirical evidence to say how successful it has been. As you rightly say, that is something that our missing person coordinators lead on, and it complements the return home interview afterwards. But part of the work I think we'll be doing with E&I going forward and internally looking at our own mechanisms is to gather exactly that data. How can we prove it's actually working? So apologies, I don't have that to hand. Uh, if you have anything at all, please do share with the committee. But, uh, but, uh, but if you haven't, then if you, it would be good to catch up with, with, with what, your, uh, what, what your findings are, okay? To, to please do, yes, yes thank of course. You. The, the next question is also uh, to you. In what ways has the matter has improved the way it works with partner organizations to help prevent repeat uh, incidents of children going missing. Yes. And I think the, at the heart of that, again, without repeating myself too much, lies things like the Philomena Protocol, where we work with the care homes to ensure that where children are reported to us, that it's because they're genuinely at risk and, and genuinely missing and not just testing those boundaries. Increasing that awareness of partners and working on the joint responsibility agreements to make sure they understand what we're asking of them is a really key tenant within that, whilst simultaneously educating our own officers about all the risks that might underlie a missing persons episode. So I'm mindful of the time of the panel, and I've said some of that before, so I don't want to repeat it too much, but that would be the mainstay of that. Yeah, and, and one of your part of, I know it must be social services, but do you also link up with the, with the NHS, for example, for, for, with GP practices? I wouldn't necessarily cite, I mean, I do an awful lot of work with the NHS on a whole range of issues, and I'm really grateful for their support in everything from, from SARCs to stalking. Um, it isn't something that I necessarily think of them first and foremost as, as a partner in this space. However, they certainly are a valid partner. I think more so they it's may, a they case have information. Working. And GPs may have information about family dynamics, this sort of things, which may be I indeed. Uh, and in fairness, if that is a, a, an unexplored avenue for us, I, I'd have to look into that separately. But certainly in terms of partner agencies, it is our non-governmental organizations who support us, charities like the colleagues here and support agencies who we do try to actively engage with. And in fact, Susanna was just talking to me before we sat in session today yes. about the you know, slightly lower than expected uptake of the tech safe. So it's exactly that sort of dynamic we need to build on. Okay, great, thank you. A and the <laughs> next question is to the, uh, to all of you, the rest of the panel who want to make contribution, it's about, uh, uh, are you confident that high quality return home interviews are being offered to every child? after missing incidents in London, and is there room for improvement anywhere, in your opinions? Yeah, I can I can comment on that if you like, and being, I'm, I'm actually quite old and was um, involved in the campaign for the introduction of return home interviews, yes. Um, yes. and for many years worked at the Children's Society as a director for Safeguarding, who um, deliver many of them across across the country, including here in London, or they certainly did when I was there. And I I think we are at risk of seeing that the the undertaking of a return home interview in itself is going to somehow create safety. And I think it might have been Beverly earlier that talked about utilising what comes out of those return home interviews. So I think at the moment. They're certainly not happening in a timely fashion. The idea was always that they were going to happen very quickly and that they should lead to a support plan off the other side. And very often that isn't the case um, for, for a variety of reasons that I won't bore you with. But essentially, the return home interview in itself isn't adequate to somehow prevent children from going missing again. It should be part of a much bigger picture and I'm not sure that the resources are in the system um, that are allowing that to happen in every incident. Thank you. Uh, so certainly, yes, come in, please. Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, I support everything that Sherry says. They're only as useful as, as what happens afterwards, whether that's follow-on support specifically for a return child or um, referrals into other services that the child's then able to access. 
but I just want to make the case for return home interviews because they're one of the few universal services that don't have a threshold. So every child should be offered one who's been missing on every incident that they've been missing. And they're such an important opportunity to find out what's going on for that child. Having worked with return home interview workers, they can be a really incredible way of finding out that there's something seriously wrong in that child's life. So we know that money is getting tighter and tighter and tighter, right? But I would really make the case that it's so important that they continue um, for any funding that's available from MOPAC and from local authorities to make sure that happens because they are really critical. I, I actually, I mean, who conducts them? Who's, whose responsibility is it primarily to it's do so? The local authority's responsibility. So uh, uh, the guidance tells us that uh, the local authority mm -hmm. should um, offer a return home interview within the timescales you've heard talked about. The, um, where we feel we have successes is largely clustered around children who are looked after below the age of 15. Mm -hmm. uh, after the age of 15, that becomes more challenging to gauge them in the conversation. And we're piloting, as practice leads, with an app that allows children to do their own return home interviews, and we'll see what comes out of that. Mm -hmm. But that came from the analysis of the return home interview, so I do support your point wholeheartedly. I don't think this is something that the sector is ready to see us introduce something else. We must allow that um, the engagement with trusted professionals who have the confidence of our children to do go through this process. But to, that it shouldn't stop there. We should do the intervention and it should inform plans going forward. But also the analysis across the piece should be fed up to the Met. Um, that, that's what we'd like to see. So the local authority does the return home interviews. And then do you share it with, with the Met and other partner organisations? We will share it with our local BCU and particularly if there's a repeat missing episode, we will pull the return home interview findings um, into that strategy meeting and discussion. Okay, so thank you. Can and I, and I does the Met do uh, return home interviews also? Does the Met do them? Uh, forgive me, no, return home interviews are the responsibility of the local forgive authorities. One of the questions here, yeah. which is in my briefing, is has the Met completed the delivery of his return home interview training? So the answer to your question must be that this, you, don't, you don't see this as your responsibility. No, it's, yeah, so you it, it, it's, it's clear that the return home interview function sits with children's social okay. care under the directors of children's services. Um, how the director um, uh, stipulates how we how we do that across the partnership is is part of the complexity. So in my neighbouring authority, Islington, they have a different system to, to what I have in Haringey. Um, mm -hmm. And so each BCU will be um, stretched across the political drivers from each local authorities. And that's part of the issues that we're trying to resolve. Right. <laughs> and is there any specific training, I'll, I'll come back, but is yes. there any specific training for return home interviews? And, and is there a, some sort of attempt to have uniformity, rather, right, that we get it all right, or, or that we use, use best practice. <laughs> I'll, I'll happily take that. It's a really interesting point about training, actually. Um, so just to be clear about language, I don't want to keep going on about language, but I think this is where some of the confusion lies. Yeah. Um, the police conduct um, what's sometimes called a prevention interview, what used to be called a safe and well check, and I think locally tends to be called a found debrief in some of your um, services, immediately when a child is found. And it might be that at the point where they actually, if they're recovering the child. Mm -hmm. um, Confusingly, that's sometimes referred to, mm. um, both inside and outside of the police, by a return home interview. Technically, oh. that's not, though. Okay. That, that is one thing. And then a return home interview is the responsibility of the local authority. Now, they might, they might have a, a dedicated team. If um, the child is open to social care, it may be completed by a social worker, or it may be a commission service, and that's where Catch-22 are sometimes commissioned to, to do that. Um, in statutory guidance, it does state that every child who has been reported missing should have access to an independent return home interview. Um, in practice, in some areas of the country, and I, it, London's so complex, I can't really speak, <laughs> there are so many boroughs, I can't really say what's the practice uh, overwhelmingly here, but sometimes it's only certain cohorts who are actually <coughs> offered that. So it might be children in care, or it might be children um, who are first time missing, or it might be children who, on their third 
missing incident. I think that, that there is, so there is not uniformity of practice. And I would absolutely endorse what Susanna says. It is the one threshold three free intervention when there's no other concern around that child at all. The family is not open to social care. They're really succeeding at school. Um, and yet there's clearly something going mm. wrong in that child's life. And that can be an absolutely key moment. And in connection with exploitation, by no means all children who go missing um, are being exploited. But almost every exploited child will go missing at some stage. And so it's absolutely key that they receive a good quality return home interview. In answer to your question about training, different organisations have different training programmes. I know that there are a couple of national bodies who are looking at developing um, return home interview training, but there isn't a nationally recognised package or even a London-wide package of return home interview training, um, partly because of the the huge range of people who deliver them. Mm. I, I mean, Susan, not, not only is there a confusion about the training, there's also confusion about the terminology, right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. What, does, what does a return home interview really, really mean, right? Well, a return, a return home interview, I think most people understand what that means. It, it's, it's sometimes the... The, the language around the police, um, immediate police intervention, um, that I think can be can be difficult. Just one more point about language. You asked about the quality of return home interviews, and I would just like to point out how how important it is to avoid victim blaming language. Mm. And um, I, I I even note, um, sorry, I've got such a sensitive antenna for this, but I even note in the briefing that we were given, we were asked. Um, to identify uh, the link between going missing and criminal exploitation, but the challenge is in protecting and safeguarding children from sexual exploitation. Why are we using the language of protecting and safeguarding when it's sexual exploitation, and yet we're talking about making links with gangs when it's criminal exploitation? All these children need safeguarding and protecting. And sometimes, just subconsciously, we use the language that blames victims for, you know, a child doesn't get to choose the ways in which they're exploited. That's literally diametrically um, mm. uh, antithetical to, to exploitation. Um, but if a child has been criminally exploited, I think there is still an assumption that they might be making lifestyle choices, which is not valid. Uh, and of course, the, the other thing was, uh, is that, of course, you all said that it's very, very important, right, that we have these return home interviews. Therefore, I, I'm assuming that they are giving you relevant information. Um, about why it's happened and how to prevent it. Is, is that the case? Oh, tremendously rich information. I mean, sometimes the first one won't, the second one won't, the third one won't, and I would really advocate for the continuity of work, uh, working with a child. And sometimes then on the sixth return home interview, they make a massive disclosure about, you know, exploitation that may have been going on for some time. They might talk about people, places, um, uh, they, they, they might give really important police intelligence, but uh, crucially, that's the opportunity then that uh, at which the child can be safeguarded. So it might look like some return home interviews actually are not doing very much, but what they are doing is building relationship, building trust. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think our one concern is sometimes what then does to happen to the return home interview information, because if a child is not open to children's social care, mm -hmm. Who is going to act on that? Who has access to that? And I would just like to um, echo what Sherry said, that the initial idea was that that information would then be gathered and acted upon, and it is crucial that that second piece happens. And just fine, because I, I would, and do the children get a named social worker to look after them, or is it just the emergency social worker who ends up handling the case? They don't necessarily have a social worker at all. If you have okay. a return home interview, yes. um, uh, the, that, that provision will be made. But if there's nothing that flags up um, concerns uh, for, for a child assessment, then that they may not ever have a social worker pick that up. Okay. And that's why we support Susanna's view around the return home interviews. And so most local authorities, and particularly the ones um, across London, do have systems at every level of the um, threshold decision-making place, universal services, right up into the acuity of tier four. Uh, and so in, in, in using my own bar as an example, we have trained up in a model that we've devised <laughs> with the guidance from people like Research in Practice, mm -hmm. return home interviews for family support workers and some of the, term, the primary school family support te mm -hmm. teaching staff. But th that's a local decision that we took um, and where we share the BCU, the challenge for the Met is we will we have a, a, an arrangement, 
that, that we gather information from them to inform those returning to home interviews, but my counterparts may not because they have a different system in place. Great. And that's look. really the challenge. Yeah. We need some, the consistency for me is not just about workforce and continuity of the same staff and the way we have joint training. It's around the pathways and processes and the governance arrangements that sit under this very vulnerable area um, that is left to very local, bespoke uh, 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 kind of planning. And I think that does impact the mayor. Has anyone done a, 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 a survey or assessment of, of what the services are across London? I mean, how do they, is, is, is that information available? So earlier I, you heard the commander talk about the London Innovation Alliance, mm -hmm. um, and they are about to produce a report in November um, addressing this very issue, mm -hmm. but using it through the lens um, uh, looking at the multi-agency safeguarding um, uh, uh, strategic board and how the MACE operates, but from that piece of work, I think we're going to get some very helpful suggestions. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think Sherry Peck wanted to come in several times. No? No, I, I, actually, I think Sarah said everything I wanted to okay. say. So that's lovely. I've got two Assembly members. Assembly member Bahari to start with. Um, it's actually what Sherry just said about the fact that she was concerned that things weren't being done in the timely way. So I'd like to pick up on that point that you made because there is concern that the police prevention interviews are not always done face to face and are on the phone. Is that a problem? And then the, cons the other concern that I, well, I picked up on, on our notes on the brief was that the return home interviews is not always passed down back to the police. So I'd like some clarification from Sherry and uh, from yourself, Kevin, as well on those particular issues. I, I can just say in my personal experience that when um, services have been outsourced, and we, that's the point I wanted to make, is that although the local authority has the responsibility, on occasions they commission services, and that just adds an additional layer to the timeline of when a child, somebody knows a child's gone missing, then you've got to tell somebody in the third sector. And of course, these interviews can only take place once you've made contact with the child and they consent to engage with you. Um, and that is very often some of, some of the issue. And then add to that, the complexities that Beverly just described um, to members of the panel very eloquently, so I won't reinforce that. Thank you, Sherry, and, and Assembly Member Kahari. I think the, the point that Sherry just made is a really good one about that being child-led. You know, this is a, a, we need the compliance to actually do that, and if, if a child prefers to be spoken to on the phone, that may be something that we, we have to do. Obviously, that wouldn't be in the immediate recovery of that child because we need to physically see them and make sure they're safe. Um, but certainly in terms of any, any preventative meeting, we will be directed by partly the, the child themselves as to how they want to be communicated with, if at all. Um, the other point that you made about um, the return home interviews information making its way back into the police system, there should in every instance be a multi-agency safeguarding help referral for every missing child in the city. And that, as I alluded to before, is the point at which we should have a single point of entry for this, a single point of consideration, where multi-agency partners put back in the readout that they got from the RHI, from the inquiries themselves, from repeat instances, and that child's weighed up in the round, and if a strap meeting needs to take place, then it can. And, and that was really, really the problem solving, the grit of it should be done. So I'm hoping that is the case in every instance. Obviously, we have 29 mashes across the city, across 12 BCUs and 32 local authorities. So there will be a disparate you know, um, landscape there in some ways in terms of how different agencies work. But largely, that is the plan. It goes into the mash, a single agency refer sorry, a, a referral into there where all of that should be weighed up. And if there's relevant information from an RHI, for instance, that should be weighed up in the round there by a multi-agency strat meeting. Thank you, Assembly Member Best. Thank you, Chair. Um, as someone who's been lucky enough to go on a missing persons interview training and has lived in that sort of the world, I found, as Beverly probably you know, with this such an important tool, it often becomes, as it does with statutory duties, also something that's so weighed down by at what point you must do something, at what form you must fill out. And linking that in as well with the very circular nature of the interview process and the, the, the recurring missing children, how do you, I, find, I think it's very easy, and Sarah, you know, you're spot on with it, it's that sixth interview, but, and it's very easy perhaps in this room where we're talking about one singular issue to say, you know, keep on going, keep on, um, he, but how in practice, Beverly, do you make sure that that happens and that instead of uh, it being very process driven, filling out the form, making sure that it is useful every time and making sure that it stays 
clear that that breakthrough could happen on the sixth time. And also that circular nature, maybe the, the non-engagement as well. So that's also something, you know, it becomes to a point where whoever is maybe working with this family or this child expects that they will not get a reply. You know, when you, you've, you've got a multitude of other cases on your lap and you know this child's not going to engage and, or engage, how do you also break that and, and, and make sure that in reality, whilst it's very easy to say in this meeting to, you know, keep on doing it and get to that sixth interview, how in reality do you think it's best that local authorities can do that? Um, I think that lots of local authorities have moved away from model, the service delivery model around return home interviews. We were expecting the social worker to do it as part of their day job and have invested and put the financial investment into having teams of people who are available to um, act, uh, to do the return home interviews and to maintain their relationship with the young people that we think are most at risk of going missing um, through a wide range. And I'm happy to send a separate note on how it works, not just from Haringey, but and, and other local authorities. But the, that independent, um, trusted professional are working through people like teachers in the schools. Um, having social workers based in some of those schools is an incredible um, uh, place that children feel comfortable and safe and going to talk to because the skill of the social worker is present, but the sect doesn't carry the same weight of feeling that they've betrayed family, friends, and, uh, and other people. Uh, so the independence is the important thing for the local authority um, and that's why there is a tendency to outsource it to try and achieve that but you've heard some of the complexities of that what we do is have then mul um, regular reporting so that we have the data that tells us about the impact and as part of the quality assurance measures across the local authorities we actually want to hear from children sharing their experience of the process and what can change and so in our, um, uh, 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 our panels um, many local authorities have children who are sitting in the, what's called the Aspire panels or the children's councils or the parliaments uh, and they this is a topic that is embedded within the agendas of the things they report back as representatives, children's experience of the process. Definitely, and that, that point about the um, social workers within schools comes back to what Hina said um, earlier about integrating the schools. And, it, and often family support workers is such a good option as well because social workers still still bring that stigma. So a level beyond that, below that in schools often does uh, really help with those two points. The, the second question that I had um, was around uh, preventing future incidents and now that often that's we're, we're thinking about this real time with the children you know who are in their teenage years this is happening to now but that point actually happens way before uh, in primary school years and actually it comes back to that point that Sarah made about um, these children often not having had that love of a supporting adult at their, and, and seeking that somewhere else uh, in their teenage years and 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 actually that trust with the police as a real opportunity to have primary school visits and build that up for a positive nature then. All these things are happening, and um, with the VREU, I, I've argued uh, consistently they need to do more to engage with, at primary school level as well. All these things are happening before. How can we engage better with the primary school children that, let's be honest, teachers and everyone that comes in contact with them knows that this is gonna be the problem 10 years down the line. And instead of waiting till it is the problem, how can we, intervene at the point that we should be to prevent future incidents. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm happy to uh, go with something. As a, a parent of two children in the city, one in inner London boroughs, and one is at primary school, one is at secondary school, I, I always take an interest in what they're taught in PHSE. You know, and, and I say this now as a, as a parent rather than as a professional police officer, so forgive me. But it, it strikes me there's some real opportunities there to educate young people about some of the perils of online. I was particularly impressed with what my teenage daughter was told the other day about the hazards of some issues, education around things like um, the age of, uh, of, of consent and what that means in sexual relationships. There's so many different facets that could usefully be built into that aspect of the, the child's syllabus, I think, both at primary and secondary school, that could equip them to understand this really complex world that I think they're growing into. Uh, and I say that again, not with my policeman's hat on, but with my, my dad's hat on. I think there's something that we could, um, yeah, I, I, I think there's, a, there's good stuff being done there. I think it perhaps could be emboldened to, to help these young children and young people understand the perils that might be out there and avoid them in the first place. And that's across all, all strata of society. I don't know if my peers would agree. Um, but that's just one observation. 
I, I could add, we, we did some work last year um, in some of the junior schools in some of the London boroughs utilising an intervention that's been rolled out across Scotland, which was like a bystander intervention that supports young people to, in effect, recognise things and recognise when them and their, their peers may need support. I think that's something that's worth investigating. It's had a massive impact in Scotland. I think that there is something about, and we do quite a lot of our work in schools and find schools very supportive. And I would absolutely endorse that teachers know what's coming upstream. And I think there's something very often when we're working with a child that's say 14, sadly now we are also working with children at the age of six, seven, eight, um, because they're also involved. So I think there's something about the social workers in school investment that is absolutely needed. There's something about supporting teachers who are always, always very, very trusted. But some of the biggest resources um, that we see at Safer London that we could utilise a million times over if we had the money was family support, because actually the biggest protective factor for children, especially from contextual risks, not perhaps, you know, safeguarding risk in the family, but the contextual risks, the biggest protective factor is families if they can be supported. Um, so alongside the school and alongside social workers in school, for me, that would be an ideal model. I couldn't agree more, Chair. Um, the, uh, there is a lot of work that happens in, within the local authority and across the partnership that really focuses on the engagement with the children who are in school. Often the children we are con most concerned about are those who are not engaged in their education present or, or remotely. Um, and I think that there is something about um, prevention is really better than cure. But if we're going to really tackle prevention, that must start pre-birth uh, with parents. Um, and that our parenting programmes across the local authorities really need to not be shy about putting these types of risk prevention conversations in the parenting programmes. Um, children need that. The, 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 if parents get it, if parents is strength, if the parenting is strengthening, is strengthened and doesn't collapse, uh, you know, when they come to adolescence, then we stand a better chance of meet, reaching a target of zero missing uh, and other zero targets around the uh, kind of the risk com risk landscape. Um, and I think that the only other comment I would make is for areas where we believe that actually some of the experiences that our children tell us they have, have a common denominator. And that is m the majority of them come from very impoverished and poor backgrounds. Um, and I think that there is a wider societal piece, a political piece around addressing the impact of child poverty. Okay. Absolutely. I would just in endorse all of that. And, and I think, um, yeah, parents and communities are our hugest untapped resource. Um, just to say um, also the importance of, um, you know, activity, making sure that there is lots of opportunity for children and young people. And obviously, um, uh, we've talked about diversion, but I think, you know, trying to engage children very early in, in uh, meaningful activities. And I won't, yeah. I'll. Yeah, I mean, we could talk all day because, I, I mean, I agree with that and I know the panel do, but it, we have to limit this. I th are you happy with your answers, Assemblymember Bess? Thank you. Th this is such an important subject and I don't think it's spoken about enough. It, it does my uh, heart good to see that we've got such good multi-agency uh, working here as a, an ex-leader of a council. You really get things uh, resolved or certainly assisted when all the different moving parts come together. Um, so th that's really good. Um, is it all right if we write to you or there's there's quite a few questions still left certainly in my mind that i would like answers for that that we can put into some sort of report going forward um and uh, certainly sarah you were quoting quite a bit there that i think we'd find quite helpful uh because it gives a broader base of people's views so if we may do that thank you very much so i'd like to formally then thank our guests for attending the meeting especially kevin whose anniversary is today 20 25 years in in the met very 
uh, congratulations to you uh, and thank you for participating in the discussion. Can I ask the committee to note the report in the discussion? Noted. Thank you. Can we also delegate authority to me as chairman in consultation with party group lead members to agree any output arising from the meeting? Agreed. Thank you. Um, at this point, I think I'll just have a one minute pause. We've got somebody else coming in to speak and I... <laughs> I'm sure you don't want to be sat here for another while while we finish business. Thank you all very much indeed. I'll, I'll stop the meeting so Emma Strain can come in and then we'll resume. Thank you very much. Okay, we now welcome Emma Strain to the GLA's monitor, uh, who's the GLA's monitoring officer, who will introduce the report briefly, if you will, Emma, on the proposed changes to the GLA guidance on complaints and conduct matters. Thank you very much, Assembly Member Hall. Uh, yes, so there's a short paper which I've provided, which sets out the proposed changes to the GLA's guidance on complaints and conduct matters about the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime and the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime. Um, this has been, uh, these updates are proposed in response to updated guidance that's been published by the IOPC in March this year and the guidance to ensure our guidance aligns with the guidance that they provide on how uh, we should uh, manage complaints and conduct matters. Yep. Okay, has anybody got any questions to Emma? No, thank you. So can we agree the amended GLA guidance for the handling of complaints and conduct matters to take effect immediately? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. And thank you, Emma, for sitting and waiting for us. Not thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I ask the committee to note the work programme for the 22-23 Assembly year? And, of course, the next meeting of the committee is scheduled for Wednesday, 12th of October, 22, at 10 a.m. in the committee rooms 2 and 3 at City Hall. But now we have any other business. Um, and I'm going to read this out uh, so I make sure I get everything Absolutely correct. In accordance with section 100B, um, 4B of the Local Government Act 1972, I've accepted one item of urgent business outlined in the supplementary agenda published yesterday, which recommends that the committee A agrees to use its meeting on the 16th of November 2022 principally to put questions to invited guests on matters around the resignation of the former Metropolitan Police Commissioner Dame Cressida Dick, DBEQPM. B. Under provisions of Section 33.5 of the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act 2011 requires the attendance of the Mayor Sadiq Khan in his capacity as the occupant of the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime at the meeting of the Police and Crime Committee, which will take place at 10 a.m. on the 16th of November 2022, for which notice will be given in due course in accordance with Section 62 of the GLA Act 1999 as amended as per Section 33. Uh, subsection 9 of the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act 20, 
11. To answer questions around his actions in relation to the resignation of the former Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Dame Cressida Dick, DVQPM, and agrees to invite Sir Thomas Windsor to attend the committee's meeting on the 16th of November 2022 at 10 a.m. to answer questions in relation to the resignation of the former Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Dame Cressida Dick, DBE, QPM. Can I ask members to agree the recommendations set out on the supplementary agenda? Agreed. Um, Assembly member um, Desai. So, um, we move into the debate now. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Chair, firstly, I don't think that this matter is actually urgent, but moving to the crux of the matter, summoning the mayor is a power that this committee should use wisely, rightly, and properly. I think it's important that we follow proper procedures and processes, and I would make the same point if the mayor was of a different uh, political color. Summoning the mayor could give the impression, the wrong impression, that he doesn't want to come. So I propose that we take this matter forward uh, in two ways. We should invite the mayor uh, and ask for an answer, say, within the next seven days. And I'm sure that he would accept our invitation. If he does not accept the invitation, then we should consider summoning him. Um, and I also would suggest that uh, there are other parties involved in this matter, namely the ex-home secretary uh, and the ex-metropolitan uh, police commissioner. We should also invite them as well. So again, just to repeat, we should follow proper pr uh, processes and procedures, invite the mayor, give him a time to scale, say, as I say, seven days to respond, and then consider summoning him if he doesn't respond. Thank you, Assembly Member Desai. Assembly Member um, Russell. Thank you, Chair. So I am very keen to hear from the mayor about his views on the Windsor report. Um, but it's unnecessary to go straight to a summons. I would, of course, support a summons if the mayor had been formally invited um, to attend the committee and had not accepted the invitation. So that is why I will be voting against this recommendation today. Um, uh, uh, Assembly Member Sahota. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Look, I, I think the uh, committee is of one opinion that we do want the mayor to come uh, to the uh, committee to, to, to give his views on the report for, by Sir Windsor. But I think it's most discourteous, given that we still haven't formally asked the mayor to attend, the committee has not asked the mayor to formally uh, attend, hasn't given the mayor an opportunity to accept, and that you uh, go um, immediately uh, to the action of summoning him. I remember here when previously a former mayor of London, Boris Johnson, was required to attend for answering questions on the Garden Bridge. We offered him the invitation to come. It is only when we had no other choice that we uh, issued a summons. Summons is the last tool that the Assembly has available. And I think in the interests of scrutiny and justice, and that Londoners will want to also know that the committee is acting impartially, with objectivity, that the committee should also be inviting um, the former Home Secretary, the Right Honourable Priti Patel, and also uh, Dame Krista Dick, uh, the former Metropolitan Commissioner. Because if you really want to know the facts, and you are acting in a non-partisan way, and not acting in a political way, and you really want to open the facts, those two people should also be here. And I think this committee is being pushed into a position which he didn't need to be chair. And I will be voting against this motion, not because I don't want the mayor not to be here. I want the mayor to be here. I do want the mayor to answer questions, but I also want to be sure that the integrity of the Assembly, the integrity of the Police Committee is maintained, that we are an objective body which looks for the facts right and doesn't act just for the political uh, hour of the moment, because there are a lot of other things that could happen, but we don't do those because we, have, we are above those moments, Chair, and I think this is being unnecessarily brought in 
given the fact that the mayor has not been formally invited, we should, we should allow the, the mayor to respond. And if the mayor doesn't come, then, of course, we have this option available to us. Thank you for giving me the opportunity of speaking to you. That's okay. I always give everybody the opportunity to speak, as you well know. Um, and in answer to some of the points, um, I, it, I've uh, written down wisely and properly and correctly done. I can assure everybody this has been done properly. We are following proper proceedings. Um, if he has no problem with attending, then he won't mind. Uh, I think the thing is, this is a very, very serious subject. We must make sure that he attends. I've got a letter in my hand here when we asked him to attend another PCC meeting, Police and Crime uh, Committee meeting, and he answered back, my Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime, Sophie Linden, regularly attends PCC meetings on my half, behalf, and I'm happy for her to continue to do so. And that was over an issue that all members really wanted him to come to. So given that we've got such a packed agenda with so many issues that this particular committee um, want to look at, I think it's only right that we make sure that the mayor is here. Of course, very happy to invite um, anybody else, the um, Pretty Patel, certainly I will make sure that an invitation goes to her. I'll make sure an invitation goes also uh, to Dame Cressida Dick. No problem about that at all, which I've said to you. Uh, the reason that uh, Sir Tom Windsor was specifically put there is so that we are open and we are transparent and so that the mayor does know what he will be coming into and that somebody else will be there um, putting the other side of the report, which of course Sir Tom Windsor penned in the first place. The um, committee is not being bounced into anything. We have a vote. We will, we will vote, if that's what you require, on whether we should summon the mayor or not. Um, I prepare to put that to the vote now. Uh, somebody move my garret. Just, I mean, just to add to that and to, to respond to some of the comments I think that colleagues across there were making. I mean, the mayor says in this matter that he acted properly, and he says that he, he can justify his behavior, and it's our job as the assembly to scrutinize that and to test that. And the forum to do that is here, and for us to do that, he has to be here. And he is never here, to my knowledge, at this committee. Um, so my view is if he is willing to come here, it makes no difference whether he is formally summoned or just asked nicely. And my sense is that the Labour group want to ask nicely so that he can decline, and then uh, he doesn't want to come here and answer questions in case his story unravels. That's my concern. That's why I think we need to summon him. I think if he's willing to come, it makes no difference whether he's summoned or asked nicely. That's my view. Our job is to scrutinize the mayor, and we can't do that unless he's here, which he never is. And so that's why I think we need to summon him both to A, make sure he's here, and B, make sure it is understood how important this is that we wish him to be here. So that's okay. why I'll be voting for this item. Thank you, Do you chair. want to come in again? Uh, the chair, yes. Uh, can we take my amendment first? Because I've, I've actually proposed an amendment. Um, and also, as I said, just to make the point again, that summons gives, uh, summonsing the mayor gives the wrong impression that he doesn't want to come. But, Chair, uh, uh, the, uh, Chair I was pro uh, can we take my amendment first? That we write to the mayor. I don't think it, I'll take advice on this. I don't think, uh, one moment I will take advice. But my amendment is specifically about doing, taking this matter forward in two ways, that we write to him, invite him to respond within seven days, and if he doesn't respond, or negatively, then we consider someone sending him. Okay, I'll put that to yeah. the, um, I'll, I'll put that to the committee first. If not, I will then read out what we have to agree or disagree, and we'll, we'll, we'll vote on that. Would, uh, does the committee want to invite the mayor as opposed to summons the mayor? Um, if you do want to do that, is this, am I doing this correctly? If you do want to invite him before his summons, please raise your hand. If you do not and want to go straight to a summons, please raise your hand. That's four in favour and five against, Chairman. Okay, so, um, so we'll go back to what um, uh, uh, we're talking Chair, about. I, I want to add those two names, please, to number four, okay. Is there a four or five into the? Um, yes, but can I make make it clear to um, anybody that's um, watching or listening? I can add those names. I can't see a problem with that, but we cannot um, make those people come. We can summons the mayor. 
so I'm happy to put other attendees that we will ask to come, but as long as everybody understands, we 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 have the, not got powers. We, we, we accept to it. And, and land, them to and landlords come. will make up their own mind on that if they don't accept, right? But I think I want to be formally adding the former Home Secretary and the former Commissioner of Police. Yes, no problem. I've told you that Thank in you. private as well. I, we've mm. got no issues mm. with that. C can we all agree that we use the meeting to discuss? I bet I've got to read it because I've got to read them. Uh, first of A, do we, do we agree to use its meeting on the 16th of November 2022 principally to put questions to invited guests on matters around the resignation of the former Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Dame Cressida Dick, um, Dame Cressida Dick, I'll leave it at that. Do we all agree that we use that meeting for that purpose? Agreed. Uh, right, unanimously? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think this is one that we might not have unanimity. B, under provisions of Section 33 uh, slash 5 of the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act 2011 requires the attendance of the Mayor Sadiq Khan in his capacity as the occupant of the Mayor's Poli Office for Policing and Crime at the meeting of the Police and Crime Committee, which will take place at 10 a.m. on the 16th of no November 2022, for which notice will be given in due course in a in accordance with section 62 of the GLA Act 1999 as amended as per section 33 stroke 9 of the Police Reform and Social Responsibility Act 2011 to answer questions around his actions in relation to the resignation of the former <laughs> Metropolitan Police Commissioner Dame Cressida Dick. Um, those that re require the attendance of the Mayor and agree with this section, raise your hands now. Those who disagree with that. And that's four. So, and that's that four. so that recommendation is agree. Um, and on C, agrees to invite Sir Tom Windsor, and I'm happy to add um, uh, Pretty Patel, MP, and um, Cressida Dick, um, our previous commissioner. Uh, to attend the committee's meeting on the 16th of November 2022 at 10 a.m. to answer questions in relation to the resignation of the former Metropolitan Police Commissioner, Dame Cressida Dick. All of those who agree? Um, yes? I'm, I'm Do you want to put your microphone on? Because it won't be Yes, I'm, I'm going to abstain on that final one um, because I think it's... Uh, I think we possibly need to have a bit more consideration on inviting Dame Cresta Dick, given this is about her departure. She, well, except of course she uh, she doesn't have to come. If she wants to come, she will. Uh, so it's her choice. In which case, I'm happy to invite. Okay, good. That's <laughs> unanimous. I love it when certain things are unanimous. Okay, so uh, that is agreed. Um, Thank you. I have no any other biz urgent business, so that concludes today's meeting.